Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I am your host, uh, John DeLynn. It is September 23rd, 2021, and we are super excited for today's episode. It is September 23rd, 2021. Just one second. We are super excited for today's episode. Okay. Um, Sorry about that technical glitch. Uh, we are super excited for today's episode. This is a topic that I have been wanting to cover for a long, long time. And uh, finally, we found the perfect people uh, to work with us and to do this episode. Now, first and foremost, uh, you guys uh, who are watching on YouTube or on Facebook are noticing a new friend, a new co-host next to me. Hey, Mindy. Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, Kara Burrell is um, is not with us today. She um, she is she is a little bit sick. She's under the weather, but that's not why Mindy's here. Um, I have a dear friend named Mindy Caldwell who uh, who just happens to be really interested in this uh, particular topic. So I, from time to time, even though we love having Kara Burrell on Mormon Stories, we love having Gerardo Sumano on Mormon Stories. I reserve the right to have co-hosts special guest co-host join me whenever I dang well please because you know <laughs> after all it's my show so Mindy I brought you on today yay thanks for having me John and uh well I'll introduce who Mindy is I'll have Mindy introduce herself in just a second um for those of you who are joining us uh you should know that we are covering a really interesting topic today it is the the topic of Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow and um, we're going to get into kind of what that topic entails. But for those of you who live in a hole somewhere or who are on Mars or some foreign uh, country that doesn't get news coverage, uh, you uh, will be hearing for the first time today that once upon a time, there uh, was this man named Chad Daybell and this woman named Lori Vallow who... Um, who uh, were involved in various Mormon aspects, but long story short, somehow uh, Chad's wife ended up uh, dead. Lori's uh, husband ended up dead. Uh, Lori's brother ended up dead, Alex, and two of Lori's children ended up dead. And they are now in jail or in prison on trial uh, as the alleged or the accused uh, murderers in, in this whole situation. And um, the reason why we are doing an episode on this is because as this news story uh, kind of emerged, it's it's the end of 2019, right, Mindy? Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, as as the story kind of broke in the end of 2019, um, and and since then, there's been like national, international news coverage on the story. But one of the big issues that just always comes up is. To what extent is this really a Mormon story or to what extent is it not really um, a Mormon story? And that's kind of what the purpose of today's episode is, is we want to give a background, kind of like a high level overview of this case, case with experts who have been really digging into the story. And we really want to dive into to what extent can we really um, sort of attribute at least some important aspects of this case to Mormonism, to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and to, you know, Mormon theology, Mormon history, Mormon doctrine, and more Mormon culture. And we are super honored and excited to have two really special uh, guests with us today. I'm going to call them Dr. John and Lauren. Um, but we're going to have each of them introduce themselves. They are the co-hosts on a really cool new-ish podcast and YouTube channel that all of you should kind of pay attention to. So, uh, Lauren and Dr. John, welcome, so welcome, welcome, welcome to Mormon Stories Podcast. Thank, you. Thank so you for great. having us, John. Okay, so uh, so Lauren and Dr. John, it's so great to have you guys on Mormon Stories Podcast. Lauren, why don't you begin and give us a little bit of an introduction of kind of your background and uh, how you got into this work and a little bit about your podcast, and then we'll have Dr. John add his story as well. Terrific. Thank you. I am 
or was a TV reporter for 10 years. And I uh, got out of the reporting world in two, just, I think it was the beginning of 2019 when our son was uh, about a year old, took a break. And then all of a sudden this Daybell case came along and I couldn't stop researching, couldn't stop learning about it. And then the pandemic hit and I thought, you know what? Let's start a podcast. And maybe with that, I should go back just a little bit. My husband is Dr. John, surprise, mm -hmm. <laughs> my co-host. And we were set up by my cousin and I was a reporter in Boise, Idaho. He was a psychologist in Las Vegas and we set up a time to talk for the first time. And our first conversation was like, three hours long. And we talked about true crime in that conversation. I was like, Hey, you know what? I am covering this really gruesome murder and I'm really <laughs> distraught by it. So let me tell you about this criminal, uh, since you, you know, and, and help me understand this guy. It's not probably the most common conversation for a first date or getting to know you call, but that's where we went on our first conversation. And so being a TV reporter again, uh, I also, I am LDS, a return missionary. I served in Kirtland. And then I actually was uh, the reporter that covered Hilldale and Colorado City. And so when this case came along, I think that mm. it was just how, how do we not cover it, right? I mean, how do the two of us just not delve into this case? I had so many questions for my husband, Dr. John, who's a psychologist. I'll let him introduce and give his background. But then the pandemic came along and we thought, let's do this. And it's been, and here we are, you know, it's 2021 now, you know, a year and a half later. And I, I always use the analogy of peeling back an onion. And I think there's about, you know, 20 onions in this. Yeah. Peeling back the layers of the onions there are about 20 onions in this story. And I think we're, <laughs> I think maybe we're on the 10th. It just keeps getting um, more and more bizarre, this story, the more we delve into it. And so here we are a year and a half later, still covering the same story. And I think that there's still a lot to uncover. So Lauren, did I hear you say that your love with Dr. John was forged in true crime? Is that what I heard you say? <laughs> uh, yes, that you heard that correctly. <laughs> Our getting to know you conversation, that first call, um, uh, was and I remember I was at a friend's house. You know, it was one of those like, hey, my cousin's trying to set me up. I gotta just go take a call really quickly. Can I go to your guest bedroom? You know, at my friend's house. I'll, it'll be ten minutes. I just gotta do this like little quick, little hey, how are you? And like I said, about two or three hours later, I think we had like three true crime stories in, and <laughs> a lot of things you usually don't talk to somebody about on your first phone call. And yeah, I I, you know, oh, that's good. love at first phone call. I love it. All right. <laughs> so good. Well, Lauren, that's great to hear uh, your perspective. Dr. John, we want to hear, you know, what, what your, what your side of the story is. Uh, <laughs> tell us, tell so, us how you got interested in this. Yeah. Not, nothing says romance more than talking about murder on your first call. <laughs> so, um, that was actually quite enjoyable. Uh, so I, my name is Dr. John Mathias. I am a licensed clinical and forensic psychologist. Um, I'm licensed in a couple of states. Um, I've now done, I, you know, I lost track after 300, but I, I've done well over 500 psychosexual evaluations, violence risk assessments, psychological evaluations. Uh, I've been involved in murder cases. I do a lot of assessment of sex crimes. I do a lot of assessment of future risks for violent recidivism. Um, I've also done a lot of clinical work over the years. I've worked with a lot of victims of abuse and trauma. And uh, in addition to working with criminals and uh, more recently, I've done more expert witness work for the federal government and several states. And, um, and so that that's kind of my background in a nutshell. And um, I really, appreciated the chance to talk about uh, murder with Lauren the first time we met because because <laughs> that's right up my alley so uh, so yes we we fell in love over true crime yeah and I'm just gonna say uh, 
And, and Mindy, I, I'm going to ask you the same question I asked them in, in terms of your interest in the story. But before I do, I just want to say that one of the things I love about Hidden True Crime, Hidden True Crime, is that Lauren, you've got an LDS background, but you've also got a journalist background, and you're you're just so uh, thoughtful and so good at interviewing people. And I, you know, I've interviewed Thank a few you. people. <laughs> I, I went to a pretty good school, and no, I'm just joking. Um, <laughs> Uh, but but I love, you know, I love what you bring, Lauren. And then, Dr. John, I love it that, you know, you're too humble or modest to admit this, but you're a graduate of Columbia University. You have a Ph.D. from what? Princeton. Oh, Princeton. 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 What did I say? Columbia. Columbia. Yeah. Princeton <laughs> uh, undergrad. And then was it USC for your Ph.D.? Yeah. Right. Uh, Southern Cal. Right. I went there for my my. Doctor at the oh. West Coast so much I stayed out here. And so you bring you bring sort of uh, the forensic psychologist kind of expertise, but also a never Mormon perspective, right. which you may feel a little bit intimidated being in front of a, a Mormon, largely Mormon audience. But the truth is, I, that's one of the things I love about your perspective is you can actually provide that outsider perspective. So you guys are just a what I'm saying is you guys are a fantastic team. And I'm yes. so honored yes. to be promoting your podcast. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for pointing that out. And that's right. John is a Nevermo from Illinois, and he married a Mormon girl, Mormon woman. But yeah, so here we are. <laughs> so we'll include a link to your podcast in the show notes. But before we jump into today, Mindy, uh, now <laughs> tell us a little bit about you and um, what got you interested in this topic. Uh, thanks, John. I'll be quick with this. Um yeah, somebody earlier in the comments asked if there was a relation to Shannon, um, because my last name is Caldwell. So if there's a relation to Shannon Montez, and there is. <laughs> I'm adjusting myself here. Um, yeah, so um, so Shannon is my sister-in-law. And, and then my husband, Steve Caldwell, was on this podcast a few weeks ago, um, talking about uh, the pandemic and about the um vaccination. And so we've been joking that, you know, Shannon put in, you know, countless hours into research. And my husband's a physician in a pandemic. And I'm on the podcast because I really like true crime. So that's my little claim to fame. So basically, but, the Caldwells are taking over more <laughs> stories. I mean, it kind of feels that way, it kind of feels that way today. But <laughs> so I really do enjoy true crime. But I also, um, I'm especially interested in this case, because Definitely because it just has, you know, the Mormon element I think is fascinating. But I also have some family members who um, were previously um, very involved in this kind of prepper movement. And so it's just been something that from the get-go, this case has been on my radar because, because of that kind of background story. So, yeah. So I'm just thrilled to be here. And I also want to add that I'm really glad that uh, Dr. John and Lara and Lauren are on this podcast today because their their work on Hidden True Crime, Hidden a True Crime podcast, the the YouTube videos and interviews that they've done, in addition to their podcasts, have just been phenomenal and fascinating. And I would urge anyone who hasn't um, seen their material to to go and and dig deep because they've got some really really cool and interesting insider amazing stuff. So absolutely. Awesome. Thank you. Well, it's great to have you. Thank Mindy. you. Thank you, John. Um, I'm glad to be here. Yeah. Margie and I and Steve and Mindy were like driving to her from St. George when I learned about Mindy's interest in true crime. <laughs> and it's not just passing. It's, it's intense. Mindy is <laughs> it, it's super tough. knowledgeable about this stuff. So there's a reason she is a subject matter expert. I oh. think. Thank she you. is. We've had some conversations now about the Daybell case. Yeah. yeah we could talk forever. It's fascinating. Yeah. So I'm glad she's here. Thank you, Lauren. So really quickly, let me kind of, let me just kind of explain how this series is going to roll. This is going to be a multi-part series. Today is going to be part one in this series. I've already kind of, we've already kind of mentioned um, the Hidden True Crime podcast. We're going to provide a link to it. Um, but also, um, this is going to be part one in a series. And what we're going to cover today is we're going to give an overview of kind of what, you know, uh, we're going to kind of give a background, a really brief background of Christianity and Mormonism, especially for those of you. We have a lot of listeners on Mormon Stories podcast that have never um, 
never been Mormon. So Dr. Right. John, you'll be happy to hear that we have a ton of ex, ex Jehovah's Witnesses, ex evangelicals, ex Jews, ex Scientologists, you know, so we want to give a little bit of background just really briefly about kind of the Christian foundation for this case, and then just an overview of, of a few Mormon historical or doctrinal principles that, that I think are kind of relevant, and I think Mindy's going to agree are, are relevant, and probably Lauren to this case. And then what we're going to do is we're going to sort of introduce um, a little bit about what I call Mormon uh, neo-fundamentalism. We're going to talk about Denver Snuffer and, and Julie Rowe. We're going to talk about kind of uh, the prepper movement. We are going to talk about, uh, introduce Chad Daybell, how he got in, you know, his background as a kid, how he got into uh, publishing and authoring books. We're going to talk about Julie Rowe and how Chad and Julie ended up connecting. And then we're going to talk about the kind of prepper preparing a people movement and a vow. And that's going to kind of be part one. We're going to intermingle just a few video clips both from the Hidden True Crime podcast, but also a couple other clips, just to kind of add a bit of a multimedia element to this. But in no way are we going to be exhaustive, and that's literally why you need to go spend all your life on Hidden True Crime podcast, because they go in depth, and that's where you're going to get the in-depth stuff. But we're going to sort of end today's episode on uh, sort of, you know, uh, when, when, when Lori when Chad Daybell and Julie Rowe kind of connect up. And then we're going to save for part two, uh, sort of Chad Daybell's uh, development of what we're going to call kind of third tier Mormon theology when things start to get crazy. Then we're going to hook in, um, you know, Chad meeting Lori, give give a bit of Lori's background, and then we're going to jump into the actual crime itself. Uh and there may be a part three or part four, possibly, <laughs> yeah. possibly with Lauren and Dr. John, possibly not. We'll just see. But you can definitely count on at least two parts to this episode. At least. Yeah. How does that sound, Lauren and Dr. John? That sounds great. Sounds good. Yep. Okay, good. And we are live streaming. So one of the reasons we live stream is because we really, really like having people share their thoughts and experiences. And already we've had family members, for example, of Chad Daybell right. in our live stream now that are paying attention. And there right. are probably other people, too. Mindy is going to help I'll me try. monitor. I'm, uh, not, I'm no Kara. Yeah. So I'll try. <laughs> Shout, no, Kara, can I ask who that can I ask who that is? The, um... Oh, Kara. Kara oh. Burrell uh, is my normal co-host. Oh, no, I know Kara. Oh, okay. What I mean is. Uh, I, I... Oh, we'll, we'll ask them to share their comment and we'll actually. So if any of you knew Chad or Lori or Julie or were involved and you want to identify yourselves now, make a comment and and we'll share with our viewers and, and our listeners and with Lauren who who's joining us today. Is that and okay? I hope that people realize that we can't see the, only you can, right? You'll, You'll see be the, able to see yeah. them once we show them. Okay, once we great. show the comments. Okay, so let's go ahead and jump in and what what I wanted to do just really briefly was share what I'm just going to be fair and say there are some Christian foundations to this story that that honestly uh, transcend Mormonism and that just just sort of like uh, are rooted in Christianity, and then there's some stuff that I think really really tie some foundational elements that tie to Mormonism that I think are important to kind of uh, discuss. To, to set the stage. Okay. Which one? See right there, Mark Blanchard. Okay. So just, just quickly, Mark Blanchard um, is one of the people, Lauren, I don't know if that name is familiar to you, but okay. Mark is, he says, my aunt married Chad Daybell's uncle. The last time I saw Chad Daybell was August, August. 2019. Wow. Oh, wow. Um, there was somebody else that said that they were, they knew the Daybell family that's in Springville, Utah. Oh, there it is. Okay. Yeah, well, that's, that's so Mark Martin. is saying, I live in okay, Springville, Chad and Tammy Daybell's home. Okay. Yeah, they're both okay. from there. And August would have been two months before Tammy passed away. Right. So Mark Blanchard, thanks for joining us. And we're, we're glad you're with us. And Mindy, keep keep flagging okay. those as yep. you see them. I will. Uh, Aaron says, um, my husband and I attended high school with Chad and Tammy. Oh, this is Aaron Taylor Jones. I was, Tam I was Tammy's grade while my husband was in Chad's mm -hmm. grade. So 
that's also super cool. And and Lauren, you may get some sources uh, out of this uh, out of this uh, episode. I hope so. I'll talk to anyone. I okay. Really yeah. Um, all right. So let's just jump in just really quickly. Just to, we're not going to spend more than just a couple minutes on this. But as I was just trying to think about what elements of this case are really rooted in Christianity that can't really be blamed, so to speak, on Mormonism or even associated with Mormonism. These are some foundational elements I found. So a belief in God and Jesus in the Bible, that's obviously a really important pillar to this case. And if you believe in the Bible and the New Testament, then you believe in the teachings around Jesus' second coming. You know, there's a lot that you'll hear about, you know, revelations and Isaiah, things in the Old and New Testament. Um, you know, the, the teachings about 144,000, which um, is certainly in Revelations, and also the Jehovah's Witnesses make a big deal about the 144,000. But that's also, you know, just, just traditional Christian lore. This idea of a belief that, that we as humans have spirits or souls, um, you know, teachings that Jesus taught about there being angels and even devils that, that can possess our bodies and influence us um, in different ways. The idea of demonic possessions, that's, you know, obviously the Catholic Church and the movie Exorcist highlighted a, a long, rich tradition within Christianity of this idea of demonic possessions. Just this is the idea that you can pray to your Heavenly Father that there's an afterlife in heaven that we can all aspire to, um, that uh, there are prophets that God sends who speak for God, that we all, you know, have spiritual gifts if we choose to develop them. That's definitely, I think, a New Testament concept. Um, and that, you know, and, and, I, and I don't want Christians to be mad at me, but you really can um, trace to Jesus himself of at least two or three statements where he says that, that believing in Jesus is more important than family. Those are just some of the teachings that I have teased out of of, of biblical Christianity that I think are are foundational. Now, uh, Lauren and Dr. John and then Mindy, are, are there any, do you guys agree with those? And are there any other foundational elements that you guys would would add or, or dispute? I'll, I agree I'll, with all of those. I, I, Lauren? Wholehearted, I wholeheartedly agree with all of them. I'm okay. trying to think if there's any more that I would add at, right now, uh, but I think that's a good Christian, you know, foundation there. Yeah. John, okay, yeah. Dr. John? Sorry, Dr. You're, there are two Dr. Johns in this. In well, this live. <laughs> Dr. Dr. John will be Dr. John for today. I'll be just John. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Dr. John, anything um, you would add or I, I feel badly when you say that because I want to acknowledge that, that you are a doctor. So, um, um, no, I, I I think I agree with a lot of those. I think that's really an excellent summary. Um, I would I would add though that I think the elements of that list that led to murder would be very different than the general list. So I think we'll probably be talking about some of the elements in there that contributed, you know, more directly to the end result in the Daybell case. Excellent. Okay. And, and of course, tons, you know, billions of Christians around the world, you know, believe in all these teachings and don't murder their spouses right. or their children. Exactly. So right. in no way am I trying to suggest that Christianity leads to murder. Um, and, and, you know, I'll say the same thing about Mormonism in just a second, but. Right. Okay. So it's not, Mindy, anything you want to yeah, add or okay, take that's away? Good. That's a good list. Yep. Okay. Okay. So that's just kind of an introduction there. And then I also feel like there's just a little bit of background about Joseph Smith and Mormonism that might be useful for people to just get a taste of, to start listening for before we dive into the story, just so that we can kind of get a few terms and concepts uh, kind of on the table. Um, so this is a picture of Joseph Smith, uh, the founding prophet of Mormonism, started Mormonism in 1830 in upstate New York. And then this is to the right is a picture of uh, what's called the current Mormon Church First Presidency, which is Russell M. Nelson, the, the current prophet of the Mormon Church. And his, you know, he's the one seated, his face is below. And then, of course, Dallin H. Oaks and Henry B. Eyring are first and second counselors. Um, that's just uh, who those uh, dudes are. And a few of the principles that I think are foundational elements for this case, Mormons have a really strong tradition of this idea of personal revelation, 
that you can pray to God and literally get answers to your prayers. Yes. That I don't know if that's unique to Mormonism, but I, I will want to say that Mormonism sometimes can take that to another level. Absolutely. Um, I think that's accurate to say that that's unique to Mormonism. Yeah. Let, me, let, me, let me interject on that point. Um, as someone who was raised Lutheran, um, you know, I, I think... Martin Luther tried to do the same thing when he rebelled against the Catholic Church, right? Like he, the purpose of Lutheranism was a breakaway from from the Catholic Church based upon that same principle, by the way, that Luther felt strongly that we could get personal revelation from God. So Luther was very interested in cutting out the middleman, which was the Pope. So um, so I think there's some, I, I recognize uh, some elements of Lutheranism there too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't I don't mean to say that personal revelation is unique to Mormonism in any yeah. sense, but I, I you know, we'll talk about how Mormons sometimes could take that to another level. I think Mormon I think through the restoration we can, right? I think of Luther's uh, you know, Martin Luther um I think uh Dr. John is right and I think it, it was also you know, much it was a long time ago, right? Mormonism is more recent, but this idea that it wasn't just a reformation, but a restoration of the full truth in Mormonism, yeah. I think plays to that too. Um, you know, it, I think a restoration is a lot more, it's a stronger term, stronger word than reformation. And so when you're claiming you have the authority from God and the whole truth, which is what a restoration is, uh, I think it might take it to a whole new level. And I think, I think, you know, as I think about my understanding of Catholicism and let's just say Protestant Christianity, um, there's this idea that the Bible's been written, the prophets, you know, were, were living around Jesus's time or before. God's kind of said what he's going to say to humans, and we just kind of have to run out the clock, live good lives, and someday Jesus is going to come again. Right. But with Mormonism, the, the founding story of Mormonism is Joseph Smith literally talking to Jesus and God. And it's like, not only right. not right. only are God and Jesus now talking to prophets again today in 2021, but also th that you can talk to God too. And um, in, in very personal and direct ways that are maybe more concrete than the average Catholic or Christian. Right. That, that's kind of what I'm saying. And... Um, and members of the church, I think, still now say that the church is continuing to be restored, which I think makes makes it seem like the heavens are still open for members. the restoration it's, of all the restoration things. Restoration is still ongoing. Yeah, it's still ongoing. So there's just there's got to be new information right. and new light and knowledge, and right. that gives Mormons some Mormons this yearning for more light and truth and knowledge and more revelation. And a lot of us want to be like Joseph Smith and see God in Jesus. Who doesn't want to see God in Jesus? Right. And if Joseph Smith can do it, maybe we can too. And and anyway, I think that's I think that's part of it. Um, it's also important to mention that that you know there's a reason why we're called the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints. It's because just like the Jehovah's Witnesses that were also formed in kind of the New England area in the mid to late uh, 19th century. The church was formed as a millennialist kind of movement. Even Joseph Smith, before he died, was talking about Jesus is coming soon. We need to prepare for the millennium. You know, we're going to create the new Jerusalem in, in Missouri. We're going to gather there and then Jesus is going to come. And there were even there was lots of talk about Jesus coming during Joseph Smith's lifetime. But then after he died, there were these rumors that sometime before 1890, Jesus was going to come again. And so there's this long tradition in Mormonism of talking about the second coming, obsessing about the second coming, even developing a year's, you know, building up a year's worth of food storage so that you could prepare, um, have food for when the apocalypse happens or whatever. And then there's also these teachings in Mormonism about what some call the one mighty and strong, which is a teaching that comes out of the Doctrine and Covenants, or I think what the what some of the preppers, Julie Rowe, et cetera, believed or taught about, which was, is it the Davidic servant? Is that the term that they yes. used, Lauren? Mm -hmm. Yes, that's the term. Which is that even though Joseph was the guy, there's going to be a guy or maybe a woman <laughs> in modern times, in the 21st century possibly, 
who's going to play a restorative role, maybe even as significant as Joseph Smith, if not more significant. Is that? Absolutely. That is a strong belief in you, you called it something, the Neo, you named it, the strong belief in the prepper movement or the near death experience, visionary LDS, uh, group. I don't know how, you, how to explain yeah. that. To find that. Uh, the yeah. step up, the tier two group. We're going to talk about the tiers. So. About the tiers yeah. yeah. But, but, but Mormons are like, not just, you know, it, it, they're looking for a new, like a intermediary savior to come in modern times to usher in Jesus's second coming, basically. Yeah. Well, and to add to that, I think you mentioned the doctrine and covenants. And I think that's an important piece of scripture to talk about. Um, I served in my mission in Kirtland, Ohio, where the majority of that book was written by Joseph Smith. And I think that we have the Book of Mormon, which is considered ancient prophets, something that Joseph Smith translated around the same time as the Bible. But the Doctrine and Covenants is modern day revelation. It's revelation given from God and Christ to Joseph Smith. And I think that takes Mormonism to a bit of a different level too, or, you know, makes Mormon theology a little bit more unique that we have these modern day scriptures. So I want to point that out too. So I love it. Yep. I do have to give a shout out to my friend, Steve. He makes the comment, damn, Mindy looks good. <laughs> well, you know. <laughs> well, uh, hey, Steve, we love you. Almost 25 years married. I'm glad he still thinks it looks good. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to Steve. Yeah, that's that's important, uh, Lauren. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, I, I okay. want to just oh, can I just jump in with an time. observation. Yeah. Um, I, I would just point out too that in Revelations, for example, um, this idea of of the imminence of the second coming was has been a common theme throughout history. So um, in Revelations, for example, the writer of Le Revelations, John, which is not John of the Gospels in the New Testament, it's a different John. Um, he was very clear that this that the second coming was going to happen very soon, imminently. Uh, and Jesus made comments to that effect too. So uh, there's kind of this theme in in this idea of the second coming that it's it's going to happen soon, quickly. Um, so I I just thought that would be an observation I could make relevant to that. Yeah, that's yes. great. That's great. Thanks, Dr. John. Um, a couple other, uh, some other really important Mormon themes that you'll want to watch for. Mormon has this, this notion of the plan of salvation, where basically we existed as spirits that, that Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother or Heavenly Mothers created our souls or our spirits before this earth was ever created. And so this idea of we existed in a former life as God's spirit children. So that's kind of one state or the term probation you'll hear a little bit later. That's one state. And then our spirits are sent to this earth to incorporate bodies. And then when we die, our spirits will go to a holding place, which could be viewed as another station. And then of course, there's the ultimate resurrection and exaltation. So this idea of our spirits living through different stages or probations, um, will will come into play big time, but that certainly is a very Mormon teaching, along with this idea of the veil, yes. which is that if we lived as spirits uh, prior to coming to this earth, why don't we remember it? Well, it must be that God put up some sort of what Mormons call a veil to help us, to make us forget that previous life. So that's called the veil of forgetfulness. And then there's this, this idea in Mormonism of, of seeing through the veil of people having special spiritual gifts where they can actually penetrate that veil of forgetfulness and remember things that happened previously in that previous life. Definitely a Mormon thing. Mindy. Or can possibly see into the future as well. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. The veil goes previous veil, and future. Yeah. Veil going both ways. Right. So that's... That's an important Mormon theme. Anything you guys want to jump in and, and just say about that? Yeah. Dr. John named uh, our podcast season uh, about the Daybells Beyond the Veil. And I think that's actually a term that's used often in LDS theology when you can kind of feel things or view things as beyond the veil or it felt beyond the veil. You know, there are a lot of senses people use for, you know, 
feeling close to those who have passed or, um, so I think that that is important to note. Um, I also want to say this, and, and I know we're not getting into different opinions or thoughts right now, but as someone that was raised LDS, I never took the veil as like a literal piece of fabric. It was more of a metaphor mm -hmm. right. the way I was taught. And I don't know how others were taught. I'm just talking about my experience. But one thing I've discovered in studying um, the Daybell case is there are a lot of things like that, that some people were taught things a lot more literally than other people or take them more literally. And it seems that Chad Daybell thinks of this, you know, a little foreshadowing. Chad Daybell sees this veil as quite a literal tangible piece of material that's been you know, placed in front of him or he, him. he actually, he actually associates it with a part, a part of his brain as well. In his autobiography, he refers to when he has a near death experience that um, there's a portion of his brain and I don't remember what it is exactly, but a portion of his brain changed or was impacted by his near death experience that allowed him then to see beyond the veil. His so veil he, ripped. So he actually sees it as a as a very tangible part of the brain um, that somehow has some connection to uh, the veil. So a little foreshadowing on Chad there. Yeah. But can... <laughs> love it, love it. Okay, that's helpful. Um, some other some other uh, Mormon themes. Uh, Mormons really take you know Mormons share a belief in spiritual gifts with others. But I think Mormons can take that to the next level, whether it's this idea that Joseph Smith used a stone in a hat to help, you know, see, dig for buried treasure or to translate unknown ancient languages, that objects can have special power. Um, look for that later in the story. Mormons have this tradition of, of patriarchal blessings where uh, men, you know, uh, senior men in the church will lay their hands on your head and literally predict your future like a fortune teller. And those blessings or prayers are written down and and really paid attention to and, and revered as Mormons. During those patriarchal blessings, we're blessed with a spiritual lineage that is discerned somehow from heaven. And Mormons believe literally in the healing of sick where you can lay your hands on people's head and heal them of illnesses. And then, of course, something that's probably not known to a lot of Orthodox Mormons, and I know, Lauren, this is something you highlight in your podcast, there's a history of Mormonism of women having and using their spiritual gifts and their spiritual powers, including yes. women uh, healing the sick and and um, other sort and anointing and other sorts of things, along with women being declared, but eventually as as goddesses in heaven. Yes, and um, these are all themes that are that are important in the story. All, all true. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and that's just page one. If we go to page two, <laughs> I I'm going to add a few more. One small I, layer of the onion. John. Yeah. Um, this I'm, is I'm helpful. Gonna, You've done great, John. Oh, well, thank thanks. you. I'm going to say that that at least the Mormonism I grew up with, there was a, a a real skepticism around science and of evidence and of critical thinking skills. Not every Mormon is going right. to agree with that experience, but that was certainly mine. Evolution's bad. The Earth is six thousand years old. Um, psychologists are sketchy. Mental health <laughs> professions bad. Like that. That certainly was my Mormonism growing up. Same. You, you too, Very maybe. similar, yes. And, and Lauren, I, yeah, you can speak up if you want to. Uh, oh, they, it, um, not as much as for me, but I, I do wholeheartedly agree with you that I recognize that everyone's Mormon experience is really different. And that's, you know, it's true. And it also depends on, uh, I think, where we lived, where we were raised. And uh, I agree that some are taught that. I, I was taught to embrace evolution, but... I hear you. Yeah. Yeah. When um, when John says that, I feel like I need to ask permission to stay on now. <laughs> <laughs> am well, I, I, am I good? Too. Do I need I to sign to off, to John? We, we're both okay. we're both like not credible just from the outset. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, but you but I can stay on. You can stay on. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. We'll allow it. We'll allow it just for today. <laughs> Um, and then a couple other things. I think uh, one thing that Mormonism probably shares with Catholicism is a heavy emphasis on sexual shame, which I think is going to play in. Um, 
Joseph Smith has a history of polygamy and polyandry, uh, you know, which is either him marrying multiple women or, you know, women being sealed to multiple men. That's definitely part of Joseph Smith's history. And that's, believe it or not, this is something that many people don't know about uh, the, the, the Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow case is that there, there is talk of polygamy and spiritual wifery and, and uh, swinging. And that's something very that much, so. very much have, so. have mm -hmm. helped break that story. And we're going to be talking about that in part two, but, but we needed to introduce that concept today because it is, it is relevant and you guys are going to find that really interesting. Um, that's along with Mormon teachings around this idea of marriages are eternal. You can be sealed to people in the afterlife. Most Orthodox Mormons believe that, that obviously that men and women can be sealed together as spouses for eternity. But what many Orthodox Mormons don't know is that Joseph Smith sealed men to men and, and families to families in this sort of dynastic sealing sort of way. That's all going to play a role later. And then um, this idea that the culmination of the Mormon plan of salvation is literally that we can become gods and goddesses someday. The, the current Mormon church wants to downplay that teaching because it's embarrassing, uh, especially when we when we think about our evangelical brethren and sistren. Uh, but that's a real thing. And then... Um, <laughs> And I'll pause there. Mindy, <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm laughing at the sister and sister. <laughs> I'm being sarcastic. I know that's not how it's pronounced. I like that actually. I'm, like, I'm, being, yeah. I'm being a little silly. Um, yeah. And then, and then we're going to get into this idea of Mormon neo-fundamentalism, the Denver snuffer and Julie Rose stuff, this idea that you can actually have a personal witness with Jesus. We're going to talk about that in just a second. Okay. And then just Mormonism more Utah and Idaho are two of, of the reddest states in the United States. There's a long tradition of sort of conservative Republican politics within Mormonism and Utah Mormonism and Idaho Mormonism that 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 sort of bleeds into sort of John Bircher Society conspiracy theory, uh, you know, New World Order, end of times kind of thinking. And uh, that's obviously going to really play into uh, this whole case as well. So that's kind of setting it up and just giving people a little bit of an introduction of what to look for. And that will allow us to focus more on the case and allow people to connect whatever dots they want to connect. Um, Mindy, anything you want to add? You have been very comprehensive. That's great. Okay. That Lauren, great. how about you? No, that was great. And that last bit, yeah. Um, as far as the conservative ideals, I want to take it a step further and say um, almost uh, there's a bit of an anti-government us versus them mentality. Yeah. Yes, because there are, you know, I, you know, there are conservative ideals and then there's, you know, we're going to talk about the tier three belief system. I think we can do the same thing with this. It's, it's a little bit more extreme. It's um, us versus them persecution complex. Mm -hmm. You're right. The John Birch society was big in, in East Idaho, especially Ezra Taft Benson being from there. He was an LDS leader who was very much a John Bircher, in my opinion. And uh, I think that uh, it's it's extreme uh, political views as far as uh, being anti-government. And then that delves into, I think, the whole prepping thing, us versus them. Let's, let's prepare. Let's get ready. I love it. Absolutely. Lots of good comments coming in. I'll just share one. Elizabeth Grogan says, it's difficult to understand how Mormons believe the earth is only 6,000 years old. There's so much evidence to the contrary. And, you know, evidence. this is something that's nuanced <laughs> because there are lots of Mormons that believe in evolution sure. and a billions of years old earth. But if you read the Doctrine and Covenants, which you referenced, Lauren, and which is Mormon scripture, it literally says in the Doctrine and Covenants that the earth is 6,000 years old. Wow. And I was taught, you know, I was taught those things. It does. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so thanks to everyone for your comments and questions. I'll share one from Gerardo because he's my pal. <laughs> Gerardo says, second anointing or calling an election made sure is definitely a Mormon teaching. See Mormon Stories podcast. Yeah, and I don't know if the Chad Dabo and Lori Vallow case incorporates this idea of a second anointing, but we'll use that as a teaser and uh, we, can, we can find out whether that's true, but we're always glad to hear from Gerardo. Um, Okay, so now we're ready to kind of jump into the main uh, the main elements of this story. And I think where we decided to begin 
was uh, at a place where my uh, uh, my associate, someone that I've had lunch with, my friend Denver Snuffer, probably isn't going to like. Um, the the place where we decided to begin was to talk about what what we've kind of labeled the Denver Snuffer near death experience, kind of Julie Rose style neo Mormon fundamentalism, and um, I can. I can talk a little bit about what no, I know about Denver Snuffer, uh, but but maybe Julie, I'll I'll let you Lauren La Lauren, I'll let you begin with um, with anything you may want to say about that. And we actually have a clip of you discussing Denver Snuffer from your podcast uh, as well. Okay, okay. Well, it sounds like you know Denver a lot better than I do. I've never met him, but I do know from Lori Daybell's <clears throat> very close friend that. Lori very much loved the book, The Second Comforter, um, so much so that she was really pushing it on this friend of hers to read it and gave her a copy and said, you just have to read this. You have to read this. I understand the base. The basis of the book is that the second comforter experience is a vision with Jesus Christ himself, that we can all have that second comforter experience. And Lori absolutely believe she had that second comforter experience. And, and we have that in recordings and in testimony and in, in multiple records, we have Lori claiming yeah. that she cannot deny her vision with Christ. We have it in some fascinating podcasts that we've heard with Chad and Lori as well, discussing her vision of Christ and his vision of Christ. So it also seems that Chad also believes in his vision with Christ. And, yeah. And even to back up a tiny bit, like, I think maybe one way to kind of introduce this idea is to just talk about the notion of the fact that the Mormon church, let's, if, if we're going to kind of try and look objectively at the church, there's a lot of people that find spiritual fulfillment and edification in the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but it also is literally a corporation. I mean, the name of the church up until like last month was literally the corporation of the president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. It's a more mature religious entity than sort of a new emerging religious tradition that's only been around 10 or 20 years. It's 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 a multi-billion dollar organization that has become very correlated or standardized right. across the world. Uh, you you all know Mormons by their white shirts and their ties and their conservative dress. And, you know, the church has worked really hard to make the church experience across the world very uniform. And the the good the good about that is that, um, you know, no matter where you go, you have a comparable experience. If you go to the church literally in Zimbabwe, you'll have local Zimbabweans, boys wearing white shirts and ties, not in their native dress, but looking like you know, Utah mission missionaries straight out of the Book of Mormon musical passing the sacrament. Right. Um, and so th that's the good news. The bad news is there are many Mormons, I think, in 2021 or over the past 10 or 20 years that have started to feel like maybe the church isn't meeting their spiritual needs. Maybe the church yes. isn't right. fulfilling all their spiritual desires, or maybe they just learned the milk, the basics, but they're looking for more meat. Mm -hmm. And so for me, the reason why I wanted to start with Denver Snuffer is because what he represents, he's the face of a branch of Mormonism that basically yeah. says, or a flavor of Mormonism that I'll just for now call neo-Mormon fundamentalism. It's not Mormon fundamentalism in the in the sort of traditional Warren Jeffs polygamist right. in Southern Utah, you know, Colorado kind of area. It's not that type of Mormon fundamentalism. But it's just this idea that the church is maybe becoming, it's maybe veering into apostasy. Maybe it's become too corporate. Maybe it's become too materialistic. Maybe it's become too stale. Maybe it's lost, lost it's it started de-emphasizing the teachings of Joseph and of Brigham Young. Right. And it's started to become a little bit too corporate. And we need more spirituality. And that's what Denver Snuffer and his books, he started publishing books, let's just say, I don't know, 10 or 20 years ago. These books really started catching on. And he started saying, hey, cut out the middleman. The church is great. Joseph Smith was great. The Book of Mormon was great. But the modern church is really missing the boat. And you can have a personal witness with Jesus if you just go straight to Jesus. 
And Denver started getting a really big following of tens of thousands of Orthodox believing Mormons, started even having meetings and he would hold events. And this is all leading up to 2013 when Denver Snuffer was actually called, you know, into a disciplinary council. He lives in Sandy, Utah. And on, ironically, on like the 20th anniversary of the September 6 excommunications in September of 2013, uh, 20 years after the 1993 September uh, 6 excommunications, Denver Snuffer was in fact excommunicated from the Mormon Church for apostasy, and his movement only grew after that. Yep. And and while you know there may not be direct ties to Julie Rowe and Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow and others, although although there are, you know, I wondered whether there would even be a Lori Vallow or a Julie Rowe and um, a prepare the people and an avow and a prepper movement without some of the groundwork that that uh, Denver Snuffer laid. Now, Mindy, do you have a do you have a reaction to that? Does that seem far fetched? No, I think that that's I think you're connecting the dots probably pretty accurately. Okay. That there's a lot of people that are just thirsty and hungry for just more, not getting what they want, and I think that Denver's movement is a start of that. And I think a lot of these things just came after that. Yeah. Lauren, what do you think? Do you think we're stretching it there? I know Denver will not like this association, but... Uh... Well, I've already mentioned some things about Denver Snuffer. Very, in my opinion, harmless things. We try to stay very neutral, and I've already had a lot of people get offended. I've learned that I'm not supposed to use the term Snufferites and some other things, you know, as I've delved into Denver Snuffer. Um, but I think, yes, I agree with you. Let I'll tell you a little bit of my journey in in covering the Daybell case is that I didn't, I understood that the LDS church um, does seem to grab hold of, there are a lot of breakoff groups. And I think there always has been a lot of breakoff groups in the LDS church since it's beginning because of two main points in history. I mean, I mean it's a young church. Um, Joseph Smith is a prophet who saw God, the father in Jesus Christ. The church was persecuted. Um, you know, they were, um, you know, Governor Boggs, uh, you know, the extermination order, there was this persecution. And then on top of it, to just solidify everything, Joseph Smith, a prophet of God, was killed in Carthage jail. He was murdered. And there's this moment in history, this period where every person can go back to and say, well, what was really supposed to happen there? Because there was confusion in the church. Who was supposed to lead next? Was it going to be Brigham Young or was it going to be you know, Joseph Smith's children, or right. was it going to be Oliver Cowdery? And I think that anyone can always go back to this point in history and say, well, this, you know, Joseph Smith was a prophet. So I'm going to still believe in the church of Jesus Christ, of Latter-day Saints, but they, they were led astray at point A or point B or point C. And so I also see Denver Stuffer as, um, something that's happened again and again and again in LDS um, history at the same time. I find it fascinating in this day and age, in this modern history, that uh, so many people, um, you know, Mormons label each other. So let's label ourselves for a second. We have the Orthodox Mormons, the progressive Mormons, the um, you know, the, the ex Mormons, the, you know, there's all these terms I had no idea until I delved into the Daybell case how big this group of people who strongly believe in Joseph Smith right now, strongly believe in in LDS roots is, but and they they will not deny Joseph Smith is a prophet, but they do not believe in the LDS church. And that's been a unique discovery to me in covering this case. And I think that Denver Snuffer absolutely represents that. That um Yes, we believe in Joseph Smith and this idea that Joseph Smith um, wasn't a polygamist and uh, thus the church, you know, is corrupt and uh, we believe in Joseph Smith, but the LDS church has it wrong. I love it. So good. Chad, is, uh, Dr. John, is there anything else you wanted to add to that or? <laughs> um, I don't, I'm not particularly familiar with that strand of thought so probably not but yeah. um 
Uh, I'll be more interested um, in a possible connection. Is there a connection between Denver snuffer and near death experiences? Right. Yeah. Okay. That's great. So we've got, um, we've got, uh, we've got a clip of um, Lauren, you talking about Denver snuffer. Is this clip basically what you just said that, that basically Lori Vallow read Denver snuffers book. Is that, is, yes. is, is this mm-hmm. okay? So we're you gonna, can go ahead and play it. Yeah. Do you think it's worth playing? Um, yeah, go ahead. Okay. So what, what we want to do as part of this episode is just highlight some of the amazing videos that you will see when you go to the hidden true crime podcast. So the first clip we have is of, um, of Lauren just talking about the connection between Denver snuffer and, um, and Lori Vallow Daybell. So let's, let's roll. Towards the end of tonight's conversation, I brought up a book that I know Lori Daybell has read and that she likes. I clearly didn't delve deep enough into this topic because I've learned that the internet and true crime groups across social media tonight are filled right now with people asking, who is Denver Snuffer? So I figured before I head to bed, I'll do a quick follow-up and answer the question. First, let me explain how I know that Lori Daybell has read and likes this book called The Second Comforter by Denver Snuffer Jr. It comes from a reliable source. April Raymond, who was Lori's friend at the time, shared this with me. We are very grateful for the info April has passed along as we try to make sense of this tragedy. And she did say I could share this particular piece of information. John and I had questions about Lori's beliefs and one of those beliefs that we discussed in our last couple of podcast episodes is Lori's claim that she has met Christ face to face. So in this book, The Second Comforter by Denver Snuffer Jr., I love saying that name, he allegedly claims in this book that he has seen Christ and gives readers a step-by-step formula to having their own second comforter experience. So who is Denver Snuffer Jr. besides that guy with a really unique name I like saying? He was a convert to the LDS Church, an attorney in Utah now, and was excommunicated from the church in 2013 because he refused to stop publishing one of his books that challenged LDS orthodoxy. Does it sound familiar? He has followers. They're called snufferites. Yes, snufferites. Many consider Snuffer Jr. a prophet and consider his books like scripture, which is clearly true because this book that we bought used has a, a message in it for the person they're giving it to. And they say that this is the most helpful book we've ever found next to the scriptures. Merry Christmas. Love, Katie. So, whoa. While Snuffer wrote this book, The Second Comforter, before he was excommunicated from the LDS Church, Lori Daybell was reading it well after Snuffer's excommunication. When Lori visited April in 2018, Lori was reading this book and gave April a copy. So how or why does this matter? I don't know yet. I'm still investigating, but I'll be reading this book for all of you in the coming weeks. I think it does show that Lori was invested in learning about deeper religious beliefs that weren't being taught to her in church. It's possible that this is when Lori started to believe she could have her own visit from Christ. But again, I'm not sure yet. Hopefully through reading the book, I'll learn more about where Lori's beliefs stem from and who influenced her beyond just Chad Daybell. And when I finish, I will give a full report. Okay. So that that gives everyone a sense for uh, not only Denver Snuffer's involvement, um, potentially, or, or at least association with some of the characters, but also it gives a sense, Lauren, for what you do on your podcast, which is to kind of just share bits and pieces uh, through YouTube and then also through your podcast of uh, elements that you think might be interesting or relevant. And I love the idea that even with this episode, we can call out to people and say, hey, if you know of connections between Dever Stuffer and yes. this place, right. feel free to reach out to Lauren and Dr. John and you guys can share those. And it could be kind of a bi-directional, even crowdsourcing sort of uh, engagement, which which is part of the idea of journalism and uh, and doing true crime investigations. Is that right? 
Absolutely. John and I have never claimed from the beginning that we know everything. What we've done is journeyed with our listeners to figure this out. As I say, unpeel the layers of the onion. So we're uh, not all knowing. We are learning along with our listeners and uh, we value every source that has been able to help us along this journey. I love it. Okay. And a second clip that we have is the introduction of Julie Rowe. And before we actually dive into um, the video clip, uh, what is it, you know, Lauren, what would you want to say about who Julie Rowe was? Um, and um, and then we also need to talk about near-death experiences a little bit. So talk about near-death experiences and then talk about Julie Rowe, and then we'll play a little bit of a clip just as an introduction to her as a character. Great. Thank you. And, and Dr. John, uh, my Dr. John is right. The near-death experiences play a huge part in the, uh, the Daybell case. Um, and I, um, interviewed Eric Smith who, um, believes in Julie Rowe having gifts we're about to talk to. And he, he said himself that this prepper movement is very much, they all read a lot of near death experience books. That's sort of part of this movement. And so uh, Julie Rowe came on the scene with a near death experience book published by Chad Daybell. Chad Daybell published, was Julie Rowe's publisher. She wrote uh, near-death experience books. And all of the near-death experience books that we're talking about, they're not just, you know, I died, I saw light, I knew that there was, you know, uh, you know, a place that we went to that was happy, I saw heaven, I met God, it's, I saw the calamities of the earth, I saw the second coming, I saw uh, the danger ahead, I saw mountains crumbling. I saw death and destruction. I saw warnings. So uh, the, these near-death experience books, I think that's important to point out, aren't just about, oh, I saw the other side and it was really great, everyone. There's there's more to this life. It's more of, look out, it's coming. And you know what? I'm the only one that can tell you about it because I saw it, so listen to me, because I had a near-death experience. And so that is who Julie Rowe is. I think a great introduction. And it began with, with, Chad as her publisher of these books. I love that. And just to add my two cents, because I was kind of a, an observer of a lot of this, just because I've been following Mormonism for 20 to 50 years, depending on how you count. But <laughs> I, I remember when Julie Rowe comes on the scene, it, obviously years before I ever heard about uh, Chad or Lori, but when I first heard about Julie Rowe, um, it wasn't totally new to me. Because just like there's been a strain of like conservative Republican politics within Mormonism, um, I've always been aware within Mormonism of a strain of kind of, let's just call it new agey kind of woo um, practices that uh, you call it holistic healing, call it energy work, call it essential oils call it muscle memory, muscle testing, uh, you know, crystals, like there are lots of different ways um, that sort of this, this Mormon and a flavor of Mormonism or an extension of Mormonism that probably is, is strays towards the more rural Mormon, Mormon participants in places like Utah, rural Utah, rural Idaho, maybe the bit less educated people less professional, but I don't want to make any of those rigid classifications, but just, um, you know, even, even a, a tendency to believe in mediums or, or spiritualists, psychics, that, psychics. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, for me, that's not, it's, it's never been a part of my Mormonism per se, but I've always been aware of kind of a, an element of woo new agey, spiritualistic type Mormonism. Mindy, Mindy, I'm struggling to describe this. Is no, this at all no. reading? Yes, I understand what you're trying to say. And I wanted to talk uh, really quickly about um, along the lines of the near-death experiences and what Lauren was saying about uh, that these aren't just kind of your run-of-the-mill like dreams or vision, you know, visions that happen when these people claim to have these uh, near-death experiences, but there's it's calamity, it's, it's destruction and death you know, along the lines of what we, we, we read about in Revelations and um, 
And I was thinking about um, how I think it's, uh, some people think it might be just a really small segment of, of people who, you know, kind of buy into this stuff. But I was, I was looking at, there's a website called Avow, and I think we'll probably address that later. But I think it goes right here. It's, uh, it's an acronym, A-V-O-W, for another voice of warning. And, and I, if I'm not mistaken, I think you have to pay in order to participate in the forums. And I think that is where many people will get on and talk about their, their visions of the last days and of the destruction. And there are 20,000 people. I checked today. There are 20,000 people who are on that website. So it's, it's not a small thing. And I think it said there was like 190,000 topics that they cover. And so, I mean, there's a lot of people that are, that are hearing these visions and these stories and taking them seriously and, you know, oftentimes changing their lives drastically to follow what they believe is being um, prophesied or predicted with these people and their visions. I love it. Thanks for saying that. And a little foreshadowing. Yes, Chad was a, a big part and a big voice on a vow, another voice of warning. Towards the end of tonight's wow. conversation, and, I brought up and um, and I'll also just say that when Julie Rowe breaks onto the scene, I remember her first being known not just for near death experiences, but also for having visions, for predicting the future, and for her work as an energy healer. And that's kind yeah. of how I first learned about Julie yeah. Rowe. And that she somehow had the ability to heal people through energy work. And so I'm going to go ahead and just now really play a brief clip. Um, and Lauren, this this uh, th this is entitled announcement November 11th, 2019. If I'm if I'm right, this is going to be um, this is going to be an announcement that that comes on YouTube before the Chad and Lori uh, story breaks publicly. Is that right? That that is right. Yes, it broke in December a month later. And this is going to be giving a preview to the relationship a little bit between Julie and um and Chad. But what it gives you a sense for is kind of who who Julie was and kind of what she did. And then I'm going to play a brief clip of her twirling uh, the colored rainbow flags as well. Do you want to say who the other person is in this video? Yeah, yeah, once you introduce. Yeah, it. so um the gentleman that's uh, interviewing Julie here, his name is Eric Smith, and he is very, very involved in this in this kind of um, movement, multiple probation um, um, line of thinking as well. So, and he often kind of plays the interviewer to Julie Rowe when they do YouTube's together. Seems right? that way, yeah. Yeah, and, and and later I'm going to be talking about how important I think he is to this whole yeah, story. I think he's critical. And yes. understanding the connections to Mormonism and to Joseph Smith, honestly, but that's a, right. that's a teaser as well. But then we'll just play a brief clip that is just introducing Julie Rowe and her personality and her, uh, her business and her gifts. Uh, I say in quotes kind of to our audience. So, um, here we go. Hi, welcome to the Julie Rowe Show. Hi, Eric. Hey, Julie. But this isn't a normal podcast today. This is an announcement podcast episode. This is going to be a great announcement podcast. We have some good news. So do you want to start or should I? I think I mean, you should. You've got the energy okay. that matches the intent. So <laughs> The intensity of what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Oh, gosh. Okay. Okay, first thing, we're going to get business out of, out of the way. Um, we have registration open. For my group energy classes for next year, Eric, do we have them all on there or just the first few? I think they're all listed right they're through listed. the very last one in Rexburg in what, next November, I think. November, yeah. Okay, so acuity scheduling. We have all of the venues selected so far except for Bristol, England and Salt Lake City, but we are uh, working on those. Everything else has been secured and I am committed uh, unless I have some unforeseen emergency that prevents me from coming, I am planning on teaching those classes. So right now we have maybe 20 people signed up for Layton. That's January 25th in Layton, Utah. I can see I being between 100 and 150. So plenty of room, you guys. Go ahead and get signed up now. The sooner the better. Uh, that helps me out on my finances so that I can take care of 
security and all the all the other expenses. So anyway. Um oh sorry. Uh so we're getting we're getting some uh, feedback that the video clips aren't loud enough and we apologize for that. Uh our our monitors show that that it's loud enough and so we'll have to just figure out how to fix that in um post production as well. But but Lauren, uh I just want to give you a chance to kind of give our listeners uh, a sense for what they just heard what Julie Rowe is introducing there, kind of what her gifts, you know, she claims her gifts are. And then also I'll play while you're kind of introducing her, a video clip of her in front of an audience, kind of twirling some rainbow flags. And I just want to help you set up kind of what power she, she seems to be claiming to have. Does that make sense? That makes sense. And okay. Dr. John, if you want to join in too, <laughs> what you think she's, all about but julie uh believes that she can uh see almost everything in the future she definitely sees beyond the veil this video by the way i want to credit this video this was taken uh by someone in a facebook group called true crime underground Lori daybell cult mom and that's been a fascinating group to be in i have been introduced to studying this case of uh, web detectives and the incredible things they do. And someone from this group actually went with this camera and recorded this and, and gave it to us. So I just want to share that backstory too. It's pretty amazing what people um, are willing to do to uncover true crime on the internet. And they do an amazing job. And it's usually people that really care. So Julie Rowe, she uh, believes she can see everything. She can see into the future. She has all of those near-death experiences under her belt. She can see the calamity that's coming. She can predict earthquakes, natural disasters. What else, Doctor John? <laughs> she uh, she can she can heal remotely. Um, she can control energy, um, which you know she, as you can see right. in this she as you can see in this video. I think these videos are symbolic of past probations or past identities that she's had or occupied um so she comes out with these different personas during her, her workshops and each persona i think is somewhat symbolic of a past probation that's a good point that you just brought up dr john in this in this conference that somebody went to from this facebook group true crime underground Lori daybell cult mom and the group actually raised money because this was a 500 i think at least 500 if not a hundred dollar event per person the group raised money for this person to go. And she dressed up as different characters that she was in past probation. So at one point she put on a native American, um, headdress and, uh, said that, and then she mentioned that she was a rape victim in past probation. So she understood all sexual assault survivors in the room because she had been raped in past probations. Those are a couple of the things she did in this particular conference. Wow. Anything you want to add, Mindy, to that? Oh, just somebody in the comments said, give, give credit to Carl. Is Carl the name of the person who... Carl Danger. Carl yeah. Danger runs True Crime Underground. And I want to say this about Carl Danger. I've interviewed him. And, and I want to say something about these true crime groups, too, so people don't you know, think, oh, true crime, you guys are... you know, What is it with you two? A lot of the people that are into these true crime groups um, have been victims themselves. So, and I want to say that Carl Danger's son was... Young son was murdered. And he runs these groups and he's passionate about it. And so um, I want to put that out too, because a lot of people make fun of people that like true crime. I've learned a very different story since involving myself in this story is that uh, these web detectives are really passionate because uh, they understand um, how important it is. And so, yes, Carl Danger, uh, I think Julie Rowe knows that now too, because she's called Carl Danger out in some of her videos for attending this with a secret camera. But yes, he uh, money was raised for him to attend, and uh, he gave a full report. Interesting. I love it. Okay, so that you know, talking about uh, near death experiences, what I call Mormon neo fundamentalism, Julie Rowe, Denver Snuffer, setting a stage for kind of the thirst that a certain strand of, of Mormons kind of have for uh, turning up the spiritual heat or the spiritual volume. 
I think that lays uh, a good foundation for the next kind of major segment of this episode, which is kind of giving a background on Chad Daybell himself. And you guys have uh, some amazing content on your YouTube channel, at least a couple episodes that I listen to that really dive into Chad's family life and his upbringing and even his psychology. And I don't expect uh, you guys to cover all that ground here, but maybe Dr. John, I think it would be really useful for you to spend a few minutes painting a psychological portrait of um, Chad Daybell and what influences, what childhood and youth and young adult influences may have, are important to know when understanding kind of where he ends up arriving to and know that we have a clip in here both of him talking about at least one of his near-death experiences, the one where he's diving, um, I believe. In Flaming Gorge. In Flaming Gorge. And then we also have a clip later of him describing his dream, and this is both from your channels, I believe, where he's describing his dream that that it relates to his eventual publication. So we'll we'll ask you to kind of pause and say, let's roll the video for for each whenever in your narration of Chad's story, you feel like it's time to kind of play those clips. Does that make sense? Sure. Okay. Yeah. So um, this comes from Chad's autobiography. It's called Living on the Edge of Heaven. And that's where I get a lot of my information about Chad. He also wrote another book called One Foot in the Grave, where he talks about working as a cemetery sexton. And he talks about some personal experiences in there as well. But Um, I think one thing that stands out about Chad's background is that not a lot stands out. So in the sense that I think, you know, the way a psychologist might describe his background is it's fairly unremarkable. Um, There was no abuse. There was no trauma that we're aware of. There was no physical abuse, sexual trauma. Um, Kind of the markers that, uh, that I might look for in terms of explaining future violence. A lot of those are absent. However, um, What's interesting, one of the most interesting things in his autobiography, I talk about this on the podcast, is yeah. the fact that he he never references his mother. He talks about his mother, I think, two or three times in the book. He talks about his father and his grandfather quite a bit. So um, that is, you know, that's kind of an interesting omission to me. Um, and it, it suggests that perhaps he wasn't as close to his mother or, um, you know, we've heard from some sources that he had some conflict with his mother. So um, one inference to make from that, and this is pure speculation, but um, is that there may have been some attachment issues. In other words, um, when we think of children being raised by really loving caregivers, they develop attachments to them. And there, there's generally speaking, there's two kinds of attachments. There's secure attachments and insecure attachments. And insecure attachments can be broken down into categories, but let's just stay with those broad categories. Um, you know, I, I think it's it's not unreasonable to infer, and this is a big inference, but that um, that perhaps there was an insecure attachment there with Chad Daybell, and and that might explain kind of the lack of trust in the world, the lack of trust in others going forward, um, kind of this appeal of prepping. And um, this this need for certainty that he, he seems to demonstrate. Um, one story that we talk about in the podcast is um, that he was walking home from school one day. This was like, I don't remember exactly how old he was. And where does uh, he want, live? Where, where's he growing up? Springville. Springville, Utah. Springville, Utah. Okay. Yeah. So he grows up in Springville. Um and he's there. I, I think he's he's actually he's spending most of his young adult life there as well. Um, but one day he's walking home from school and he encounters this hive of bees and he proceeds to start killing them. Uh, and, and, and he talks about that. Um, he actually says that he, he kind of enjoyed that experience. Um, and so that was that was a little bit of an interesting red flag to me because um while it may not be atypical for a child um, to harm bees, perhaps uh, as an ex- in a, maybe an experimental way or curious way, the fact that he enjoyed that experience um, is a bit peculiar. Um, and, you know, it, it raises well, the a little bit of what I learned about Jeffrey Dahmer, not, not to yeah maybe make too much of a comparison there, but this idea 
of somehow driving joy or satisfaction out of punishing innocent or vulnerable creatures. I don't know. Isn't if that that's... kind of a common common thread for some? For um, for yeah, it, you know, harming animals is is animals. very very common with serial killers. But um, you know, bees are slightly different in the sense that they could be perceived as is causing harm or you know a lot of the serial killers will injure you know pets like dogs or cats or you know bees might be a little atypical in the sense that um potentially they could be see for be perceived as harmful and but i he doesn't you know he does describe i think he describes the story more like a Dahmer type character in the sense that he really once he starts killing these bees he keeps going and i think he killed like 120 bees so, um, and the only way he stops is he hears a voice, which he says it's, it's coming from outside of him, but presumably it's his conscience. Uh, the voice is telling him to stop and he stops. So, um, that's another interesting piece of that story is that he doesn't have the internal mechanisms to see that what he's doing is potentially wrong, that he needs kind of this outside influence to get him to stop. So, um, I mean, it's outside. It's outside his, let's just say, consciousness. But it's still all happening within his head, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it's clearly, but but his perception. It right, right. It's yeah. It's 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 very much happening within his head. But his his perception is that it's not. So, um, um, and that probably fits some of the earlier stuff we just you just talked about in terms of uh. Christian and Mormon influences. Um, there's a story about the family that, you know, we talked to a source who said that um, one of her children was visiting the Daybells and spent the night. And the next day when the source picked this, her, her child up, that um, the child had sores all over the legs. And um, so the parent learned that that, that this was bed bugs. And so the parent contacted the Daybells and said, you know, we think you have a bed bug problem. Uh, I'm a little concerned. You know, my, my child has these marks all over her body. You know, could you, could you please remedy this before my daughter comes over again? Um, and they said, yeah, yeah, of course. Um, um, and then, the problem was never remedied. So, and this was several months later um, that this occurred. So that her child went back and got bed bugs again, and then um, never sent her child over there again, because clearly they weren't going to do anything about it. And I think this is an interesting story in the sense that it really shows how this family solves problems or doesn't solve problems. Right. So that you can infer from that story that, there's this lack of communication in general in the, in the family. There's probably some lack of leadership in the sense that neither parent is willing to really take control of this problem or solve it, or neither perceives it to be important enough to solve. So um, even though there's a consequence in the community, which is that someone close to the family um, is concerned that her daughter can't visit. So, um, but the family just doesn't do anything and they just kind of avoid it. And I, I think that's a good way of, of thinking of Chad's upbringing, uh, that there's some avoidance. There's maybe a lot of avoidance. There's avoidance of emotions. There's avoidance of communication. Um, there's probably an avoidance of talking about issues that really matter. So my guess is they're probably uh, talking about a lot of things on the surface, many superficial conversations around the dinner table. They're talking about the weather. They're not talking about, you know, um, traumas or hurts at school or, you know, they're just, they're keeping things simple. Um, and so I think, you know, the bed bug story really kind of gives this general picture of, of the Daybell family and how they operate and how they solve problems and how they communicate. Um, I think it's a wonderful metaphor for, um, for Chad's upbringing. You know, I think, Chad himself, as as we know um, from his autobiography, he he doesn't communicate directly with Tammy either. He he's very passive aggressive. He's very indirect. Um, he probably doesn't deal with his emotions well at all. Um, I think many of the things you see in the bed bug story also apply to Chad's later adult life. I love it. 
Good points. Can we talk about really quickly one of those one one of the ways that illustrates how passive passive aggressive chat is, where and I I know that um, that Dr. John and Lauren you address this on your podcast. Oh, before I I say that the the podcast that uh, you talk about the bees and some other of the um, of the Daybell family dynamics is episode 11 uh, of the Hidden a True Prime Crime podcast. So I would point listeners in that direction for some really interesting tidbits. But Thank you. Uh, there was a an incident where uh, Tammy, Chad's wife, was playing a lot of um, of a phone a game on her phone. Uh, Farmville, I think it was. Frontierville. Uh, Frontierville. Oh, pardon me. Thank you, Lauren, for the for the clarification. And um, um, I'm guessing that that Chad was uncomfortable with how much time she was playing on the game. So instead of approaching her and asking her to stop playing the game or that he felt like she was spending too much time, he tells Tammy that her dead grandmother came to him in a vision saying that she was unhappy with how much of the game that Tammy was playing. So that's just an illustration of how, of how he just didn't deal with um, issues in a direct and way. And he's growing up as a woman in the church and just in, in a male led church. What, what, what stuck out for you about that story? What was interesting for you about that, Mindy? Oh, I just feel it's just another illustration of how, you know, sometimes um, you feel like you have to listen to you're, you know, the priesthood holder that's, that's over you or, you know, and I think that he, he knew that he had that, that power over her and probably exercised that. I don't know for sure, but I'm guessing that that's the type of dynamic that their marriage had. Kind of pulling rank through sure. claims of spiritual. Sure. Whether he asked him herself or he, um, you know, used the grandmother line, it's all just like, I've, I've received this on behalf of you and, um, and now you must follow that. The grandmother he, even swore at her. Chad didn't swear oh. at her. The grandmother swore oh, at her. Oh, okay. But, okay. I mean, I mean, throw that in there too. I oh, mean, spicy. we know what Chad really wanted to say to Tammy because the grandmother said it for yeah, him. Exactly. And yeah. what immediately comes to my mind, and I, I hope people are okay with me drawing this parallel, is when, when Emma Smith was objecting to Joseph Smith's polygamy, he miraculously receives a revelation, and this is in Doctrine and Covenants 132, right. where Emma's told that if she doesn't get in line about polygamy, she will literally she be smitten. She'll be destroyed. She will I be destroyed. destroyed. Yeah. Wow. And, Lots uh, of manipulation. So the, there is a Mormon element to sure. that to that dynamic of, of the male authority figure having, through the priesthood, uh, the direct line with God. And being able to put the woman in her place through that sort of revelation. Yeah. And certainly not in every relationship or every family, but I do think that, that it is probably fairly common. Yeah. Do you have anything to say, Dr. John, about that? Well, I, you know, I, I, I would address it from a psychological perspective, but I, I think um, what I would say is there's just a complete lack of assertiveness, you know, that he's like his, in his family. Um, there's a real avoidance of what's really going on. Um, so yes, yeah, it, it seems like he solves this problem through spiritual means rather than normal direct communication with her. For example, asking her, "Are you depressed?" Um, you know, another interesting thing about the Dayball family is we know that three of the five siblings um, went on to have significant substance abuse problems. Um, so, not three Chad. Of the siblings had serious drug issues, and um, for me, that usually speaks exactly to what we're talking about that the drugs typically drug addiction tends to be a type of self-medication and what's being medicated are negative emotions usually so this is a family that didn't deal with their emotions at all and especially negative emotions um and that in and that caught up with the kids later when they started becoming addicted to various types of drugs right. i have a lot of empathy for tammy daybell i think she uh was a really good wife to Chad. I think that she probably, in my opinion, didn't believe everything he told her, but went along with it and learned how to dance the dance with him, you know, and, and raised their kids. She ran their publishing company. She worked full time. She, you know, she was an incredible woman. Mm -hmm. And uh, another story of Chad being passive aggressive is aggressive is found in his book, One Foot in the Grave, about his time as a cemetery sexton. And he said that his close high school friend kept speeding through the cemetery and not obeying the laws. I, I, ironic, I know. Not obeying the laws of the land to not speed. And uh, he had no choice 
but to call the police and request them to stop his best friend and ticket him for speeding. And I thought, wait, okay, hold on. He's your friend, but you're not going to call him and say, this is bothering me. You're going to call the police and make sure he gets a ticket. I mean, it's the same kind of passive aggressive way he deals with uh, difficult right. situations. And it's punitive. It shows that they're, they're you know, instead of, instead of, keeping that friendship and picking up his cell phone and resolving it like a normal person, he has to punish him. Right. So it's, it's not just solving the problem. It's solving the problem with this punitive element on top. Right. And, and so that speaks to a, a real rigidity in Chad Daybell. Yeah. And Mindy, really quickly, I wanted to ask you just your opinion on this. It's not like Mormons invented passive aggressiveness per se, (laughs) or (laughs) the lack of having kind of healthy emotional intimacy within a family network. And wouldn't you say that sort of some of that passive aggressiveness is, is kind of, and, and avoiding the elephant in the room, and ta- keeping things on a superficial level, would you say that 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 can be relatively common in kind of the Mormon experience? I know you were raised in in Utah. Yes. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I think that there's a there's a high pressure to to look, you know, you know, all put together and have your family, you know, seem like everything just looks great. And so I think there's a lot of a lot of avoiding, you know, difficult things, um, whether privately or publicly, I think just to kind of keep up the persona of, you know, all is well in Zion. And, um, it sounds like, you know, that that could have been at play with the, with the Daybell family. Yeah. Okay. That's Does that great. answer your question? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, let's, let's talk about, let's set up this clip that we've got. Um, we've got this clip of Chad's first uh, near-death experience. I know I've listened to enough of your videos that you talk about maybe Chad had a bit of an inferiority complex, um, you know, wanted to be successful, but maybe didn't always have the success uh, that he wanted at first. What what would you guys like to say about uh, Chad's history that would be a good setup to this clip where he talks about that at least one of his near death experiences. And if you want to talk about both one of them before one of them after whatever you want, how, how would you want to set up this clip? And maybe Dr. John will have you go first. Yeah. Dr. Yeah. John, you go first. I think you should tell that story about uh, him walking to school too. Anyway, go ahead, babe. Oh, yeah. Um, Sorry. Yeah. You know, it, it's interesting that um, I, I liked what you just said, John, in terms of inferiority complex. Um, because a lot of people have asked me, you know, well, if, if he didn't come from an abusive home or a violent home or a really bad home, then how did he get there? Um, and, you know, the, the, my answer to that is you don't necessarily need to be abused or traumatized to, to go on and commit violence. I think that the issue with Chad Daybell is that he didn't get enough attention. He wanted to feel special and he wanted to feel he wanted a lot of acknowledgement. And he wasn't getting that from his family or he wasn't getting that at school. I think his childhood was very ordinary. And this was a a, a child who wanted to feel special. There's there's a moment in his book, which I think is pivotal, where he talks about he's he's at the BYU campus and it's in the middle of winter and he's walking to a class and he says, I felt all alone, like nobody in the world cared for me and that he didn't matter. And the importance of that is that it shows that he really wants to feel significant. I guess we all do. That's that's a very common human trait. But um, but with Chad, I think I think that he wanted a lot more than he was getting in terms of attention, love, uh, acknowledgement in his family. Um, And one way or another, Chad was going to find a way to accomplish that. And and so I think that sets the tone for uh, his near death experiences, his books. A lot of the things he was doing to seek attention and fame that come into play later are really put in motion during his childhood from this family that was sort of distance and didn't really acknowledge him as being special. His siblings were very talented, so they were competitors. So I, I think it's interesting that you can have a perfectly normal childhood, but if you have a child in that culture, in that environment, that's not getting his or her needs met or that has some desire for you know, feeling particularly special, you can still 
that can still create litter problems. I love it. Absolutely. We just got a comment uh, from Jasira Baldeo. I don't know how to pronounce that name, but I, it's a really good comment. She writes, yeah. not getting enough attention is a form of trauma. What, what do you think about that, Dr. John? Yeah, I mean, that that's what we call neglect. Um, right. So would, would I go so far as to say that he was neglected? Um, I, you know, probably not. I think we tend to think of neglect in terms of, you know, are, is there food on the table? Um is the is there shelter right like neglect generally speaking at least from a a, a child protection standpoint um the bar would be a lot higher there you know um so uh, you know in terms of a typical childhood i i don't think he's getting neglected but is he getting emotionally neglected um yeah i think i think that would be a good argument i i don't disagree with that part got it uh, Lauren, anything you want to add about Chad uh, and that may help set up this clip we're about to show? Anything else you want to add? Well, just to follow what Dr. John said, that Chad never, you know, he did struggle feeling that he was getting enough attention and he wanted to feel significant. And to tie Julie Rowe together with this, the moment he started publishing Julie Rowe books, was the moment I think he started to feel significant because those became very popular and he was the publisher. Right. And then Julie Rowe and her near death experiences, that was what that was. And I think he took a lot of cues from Julie Rowe and all of a sudden he started talking about some near death experiences of his that he had had. And he started to get more attention just like Julie Rowe. And I think that all of a sudden, Chad Daybell became Chad Daybell and he was finally feeling significant. And I think uh, this speech that we received through a source we're so grateful for that you're about to play, which is supposedly the day he met Lori Vallow, allegedly, according to her friend, you know, we, we none of us fully know yet in St. George, Utah, he's, he, he's speaking in front of hundreds of people at a preparing a people conference, a prepper conference. And I think this is like the pinnacle of his career. You know, this is the moment, probably, this is probably the top moment of his life, right? If you're going to like list your, you know, your glory days, I think that this would be Chad's glory days right before the fall of Chad Daybell too. Right. It, and let me, let me add quickly that, um, we know from some of our sources that, uh, Chad never mentioned near-death experiences until after he started publishing Julie Rowe. So right. these experiences supposedly occurred as early as like, you know, the late nineties. And, um, um, but he never talked about them. So there was no talk of those experiences being near-death experiences until many, many years later. I just wanted to draw a quick, quick parallel to that. Um, if we're, still uh, talking about um, foundational Mormonism, where I believe didn't Joseph Smith not talk about his first vision for a really long time until it became like a useful topic for him to, to yeah, kind of help his point. movement. Wow, that's a great point. Right? Yeah, he supposedly had his first vision in 1820, but he never told his, there's no evidence that he told his parents, his brothers, his siblings neighbors, anyone, the first account of him telling anyone about his alleged first vision experience was 12 years after in 1832. Yeah. So, so you're saying maybe there's a tradition or a tie to kind of telling, stories telling, or even memories developing right. way later. Right. Yeah. Or telling a kind of a fan, fantastic or, you know, sensational story when, when you've got some momentum and there's some motivation you know, any good speaker, any good speaker has a good story, right? And good it's point. even even to be as charitable as possible, you can believe your own stuff. You can develop memories are funny. You can develop memories of of things that you experienced that you never actually experienced and believe that, that you experienced them. Isn't that isn't that right, Dr. John? Isn't that the yeah, way? those are called false beliefs. Um we're going to talk about that in our next podcast, actually. But yes, uh, you see that with a lot with with the idea of alien abductions, um, and that's that's a big topic. And I don't want to go off on that, but right. but absolutely, you can 
under the people that are more fantasy prone are more likely to develop false beliefs. And as you said, John, memory is, is not, we tend to think of memory as um, like a recording, like it's literal, but it's not, it's reconstructive. So um, you can actually, if, if you're very fantasy prone, you can actually create false memories fairly easily. Um, that's kind of the basis of hypnosis. Um, but there has to be some desire to do so. There has to be some motive. It has to be motivated. So you can't, if you're hypnotizing someone, um, generally speaking, it's not going to work unless the person wants it to work or is suggestible or has some motivation to, to endorse or believe in those fantasies that are being presented. Oh. All right. I love it. Um, were you going to say something? Oh, I just I found it so fascinating, Dr. John, when you mentioned in one of the podcasts um, about the phrase, you have to see it to believe it. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, that's that's. Uh, uh, so there's a social psychologist by, name, by the name of Carl Weick, teaches at Harvard. Um, he has this this idea that he's researched for many, many years um, called sense making. And sense making is how we make sense of the world, that we, we tend to... Um, we tend to infer meanings based upon experiences. But what, what Carl Weick says is um, we don't get evidence. Most of us don't get evidence and then evaluate it. We evaluate things through the filters of our beliefs. So he actually, the phrase he uses is the believing is seen. You know, he, he takes the, the typical term seen as believing and, and reverses it and says, no, we've got it all wrong. Sense making is really about filtering things through our beliefs. So his, his, phrase which i love and mentioned in the podcast is the believing is seen Very i love good. it okay so let's go ahead and roll this clip which is chad daybell speaking at a preparing a people conference october uh, 2018 this is from hidden true crime youtube channel and it's also allegedly the day that chad uh, daybell and Lori vallow met but he is describing one of his near-death experiences. Now, uh, apparently there's two. Is this the first or the second near-death experience that he's describing? Are we talking Flaming Gorge in this one? Yeah, Art? Flaming Gorge. Flaming Gorge is the first. Uh, first. Okay, so this will just give us a sense for how he adopts the near-death experience narrative and how he communicates it to his followers. Is that all right? All right, let's do this. Oh. And by the way, I'll just... It was on mute. It's on mute. It's muted. Go back. I'll just tell listeners that um, there is a... You know, people are having a tiny bit of a hard time hearing the video that we play on YouTube, but there's really nothing we can do about it um, right now. So I'll just ask people to bear with us. And in post-production, at least for the audio podcast version, we'll try and get the audio levels uh, straightened out. But bear with us. Uh, we're doing the best we can. So thanks, everybody. I went on a youth activity to Flaming Gorge, Utah, in northern Utah, and my friends loved to talk me into doing stupid things. I was the younger priest in the quorum, and, and they knew they could usually goad me into something that I shouldn't do. And they loved to cliff jump. We didn't dive, but this, this certain cliff had several levels. And we slowly worked our way up, and finally we got to one that was about 60 feet high. This is not not me, but um, this is about where we were at Flaming Gorge. This, I found this photo, and they told me to go first. And as I stood on the edge of that cliff, I was like, this is a terrible idea. <laughs> but, you know, got to impress my peers. So I, I took that jump, and... It just took forever to, to hit the water, just one, two, three, and just kind of flailing. And when I hit, it was like hitting concrete. And I could, it just felt like I broke my neck, honestly. That was my first indication. But what really happened is my body went deeper than my spirit. And so I was like three quarters out of my body. It's like I came out through my head. And... Um, I looked around and I, it was like a plane of white light and just uh, an amazing uh, experience. I felt so peaceful and calm and there were little particles of light that attached to my body like they were uh, just rushing at me. 
But within a few seconds, uh, my my body and spirit went back together. I later learned it wasn't the best fit. I was uh, for 30 years. I was good at off. <laughs> so <laughs> I went to a chiropractor, and he basically it felt a lot better since then. <laughs> so, um, but a few years later, we went on a family vacation to La Jolla, California. This La Jolla Cove. <laughs> In the center of the picture there, you can kind of see some black rocks that go out. And my brother and I went out on the very tip of that at low tide. And as the tide started to shift, as we were looking for shells and things, a gigantic wave came and just plastered me. This is the same cove, a different angle, but that's about what that wave looked like. I was out on that uh, tip and then just looked up and there was this wave right there. They just call it a rogue wave. Comes out of nowhere and smashed me and I was sure I was going to die. And I was actually right. I did die. <laughs> Suddenly I, I got hit by the wave, but then I was just standing up to uh, find myself just upright. I was a spirit. I was in an orange room and, well, not an orange room, but just an orange glow around me. And suddenly I saw my grandpa, Keith Daybell, who was my father's dad. He was in an army uniform, kind of a symbol of, of who he was. And he had with him his, his grandpa, the grandfather, Kennedy Daybell. And as grandpa Keith talked to me, Kennedy was watching my body. It was floating around in the water, just kind of bouncing around. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and stop there. We're going to we're going to continue that clip in just a second. But what we were able to hear there are are both of his near death experiences. And um, Lauren, anything you want to say about about that as you as you hear it again? And then Dr. John. I've never heard someone get so worked up over a belly flop (laughs) when I heard it the first time. Um, But I it was fascinating to me. He again. Uh, Chad Daybell is very, very literal in the way he explained his his spirit. His body went below his spirit, or I, it might have been the other way around, that they separated as he went into the water after he jumped from Flaming Gorge. Was really uh, I, I noticed that was really fascinating to me. That again, that's this is sort of this very specific thing that happened. Which can I say when we jump off tall cliffs or tall diving boards, it does kind of feel like that right i mean that's the feeling i mean i would never explain it as it felt like my spirit separated from my body but i would say whoa (laughs) that's crazy we've got we've got a great comment from john todd baker he writes or maybe you just jumped 60 feet into water and it hurt like hell and i Uh, doubt he jumped 60 feet let's be honest right yeah (laughs) and then we also another comment just while we're at it josh Beatty writes the way he describes his body spirit separation Reminds me of Doctor Strange. There, there are these moments in Doctor Strange where, like, the the master punches, you know, the student, <laughs> and the body, and the spirit separates from the body yes. and then floats out. And it's a great and, description. You know, we're, we're making fun of it, but I mean, near death experience sort of tales are not in any way uniquely Mormon, right? I mean, this is right. this is uh, something that transcends Mormonism, right? By a long shot for sure. Anything you want to add, Doctor John or, or Mindy? Uh. Yeah, I, I just want to say um, I, I'm glad he didn't try out for the Olympic diving team, number one. Um, but more importantly, um, I, I, this is a really important moment, the Chad Daybell story. This is an extremely important moment. Because the the near-death experience gives him the authority to write his books, or it gives his books more authority, but it gives him the authority to really predict the future and to have his visions accepted as being real. So without the near death experience, there is no Chad Daybell. There is no second, you know, prophecies of the second coming. It, it's a moment that changes everything in the Chad Daybell story because he becomes an authority figure who should be listened to just as Julie Rowe does with her near death experiences. So um, these are important moments in their stories, I think. And Dr. John, I'm just going to say, you just reminded me of a really important connection with Mormonism and Joseph Smith. Without Joseph Smith first dabbling in treasure digging, 
and claiming to be able to see buried treasure underground, to even know about spirits guarding treasure underground, and just this lore that Joseph Smith had special powers and something the Orthodox Mormons don't remember or even are never taught, that he had a special stone that gave him special powers. That was what, that was sort of like level one authority or power that Joseph Smith developed that then led to, directly led to, once the jig was up, he had, you know, been put in jail or, or you know, been been um, ac accused in front of the court of breaking the law. And, he, and his father-in-law was, was basically denying his ability to marry Emma. And he knew that he couldn't keep on as a treasure digger. You know, a, a secular view of Joseph Smith history is, he pivots, taking those rumors or the reputation of having special power, he pivots that directly to the, quote, translation of the Book of Mormon, where he literally takes the same stone in the hat that he uses as a treasure digger to claim that he can now read sealed or un Ill illegible or unknown ancient languages. He can translate uh, Reformed Egyptian into what becomes the Book of Mormon, and again, that pivots into him being making claims in the founding of the Mormon Church by 1830 that he's a prophet and a seer and a revelator. And guess what? Mormons forget that he also called himself a translator. That's just a really direct line of claiming supernatural gifts to then claim authority um, that then sets him up to become the prophet and the president of the church. You have to claim special powers to get people to have yeah. any reason to think that they should follow you. Right, exactly. Right, absolutely. Yeah. There there wouldn't be, Chad would not be giving the speech you just played unless he claimed that authority. Yeah, it's right. essential. Right. And but, I want to well, say this yeah. too, just for reference, because, you know, I was making fun of his near-death experience. I don't want to dismiss anybody else's experience through that. Uh, we have talked to people close to uh, the Daybell family. We we have many sources uh, that we actually aren't even able to talk about. We keep our sources close, but they do believe that uh, Chad got a good, you know, scare, a good fright, that they never heard of this before either, that this was something Chad really did just kind of create in his brain later. Interesting. I hadn't heard that part of the story. Yeah. 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 That's fascinating. That's fascinating. So, so that's uh, anything else we want to say about Chad's upbringing before we transition to him becoming an author. I mean, obviously he, does he go to college? He marries Tammy. Anything we want to say just about his bio before we jump into him becoming an author and a book publisher? I have a point really fast. Oh yeah, Mindy. So he he did he does tell a story about um about applying for grad school. And oh yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, and he um, I think this goes back to him just feeling, you know, maybe inadequate or you know feeling like he has a higher purpose than the traditional path, but he he tells the story of applying for grad school and he claims that his pen, the pen he was using for the application felt like it was on fire and he felt like he had a spiritual whispering or prompting that told him you won't need additional schooling to fulfill your life's mission. Right. And that's, that's one of the things I love about your podcast. You actually hire an actor to read from Chad's book yes. so that you kind of feel like you're hearing Chad actually tell that story. What, what do you, do you remember about what episode that is? Lauren? Yeah, I believe that that was episode 11. Was it 11. Can you hand me that for a second? Yeah, and I just want to, I want to episode 11. Check out prepared Mindy Caldwell. No. She actually <laughs> has a binder of notes, <laughs> typed out notes. <laughs> So, I mean, you guys are professionals, oh, but, but Mindy's pretty close to a professional. Oh, goodness. That's Am I embarrassing you? A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's very but, impressive. We don't know, have that. I have screenshots, like, in my photo album. Where I think I think that's somewhere from last year, and then that's that's my research. So, well done. We're, <laughs> that's yeah. a talent. We're such newbies in the podcast arena that we don't have podcast notes, but we're going to have to get those from you, Mindy. You guys, right. you guys need to hire. You need, you need <laughs> a third co -host. We don't have notes yet, but you do. So thank you. Yeah, you. We're going to have to pay you. Mindy's a super sleuth. <laughs> um, Anytime. Okay. 
So, um, okay, yeah. Anything else you guys want to say about Chad before he becomes an author and a publisher? To uh, Mindy's I, story, I, maybe. Oh, go ahead, John. I, I just want to say about Mindy's story that, um, you know, we all that there. There's also something competitive there. Um, we know that Chad's other siblings all have master's degrees, and I think that threatened him to some degree. I think he there's uh, there's a little bit of shame in that story. I think in the sense that. Um, he's finding some rationalization or justification for why he shouldn't go to grad school, but he's also feeling this pressure, this undertone of competition because his siblings are all very successful and they all have master's degrees. So I think that's that's another part of that story. Absolutely. that's about And by siblings, he means brothers. He has three brothers and they all have master's yeah. degrees. Yeah, I love it. Okay. So he where does he meet Tammy? Uh, he noticed her photo in uh, the Springville yearbook. She was younger after he had a vision that he was going to marry a blonde. Uh, he saw her picture. She was blonde in high school. Oh. Her hair darkened later. He explained after she gave birth to their children. And so he had a vision of a blonde woman that he was going to marry, saw her picture and it was, um, and then I know after that, there's not much to be said, except that it was a very fast courtship, to use his term. And they were married quickly. I think she was 20, um, 19 or 20. We have a listener asking where Chad is in the birth order. Do you guys know? Oh, and that's our friend too, Julie Holden. She helps us moderate our YouTube channel. Hey, Julie. Where <laughs> is Chad in the birth order? He's the oldest. Is he the oldest son? Oof. It's okay if we don't know. I don't feel confident. I would have to go back and check that for out. A episode <laughs> of, uh, of true crime, hidden, uh, real true, true crime. hidden true crime podcast. <laughs> um, th thanks for that question, Julie. Sorry, we don't know the answer, but you know we can't know everything. We know almost everything about this kid. <laughs> um, okay, and uh, I did. How many kids do you? How many kids did they have? Five. Five. One girl, Five. four boys. So they did the Mormon thing. They got married, you know, young. Fast. Oh, excuse me. Sorry. I was thinking of his family of origin. Let me correct. He, they also have five kids. Chad and Tammy have five children as well. Two girls, three boys. Yes. Okay. And so, so I don't mean to be disrespectful, but Tammy's popping out the babies and Chad's having to be a provider. The kids all do seem to be, you know, fairly close in age. Yeah. So lots of kids right? quickly. Right. What, do, what yeah. do you know about lots of kids? Uh, I have six children. I know a few <laughs> things about lots of kids. So, <laughs> no, they had children young. There's a story of Garth, the oldest, being born, and Garth was a very difficult child, as Chad explains. Let me put it in preference, you know, in reference though that uh, Garth was two. He was two, so he was climbing. And he was a toddler, and it was so hard on Chad. He went to the temple and and prayed about it and had a vision of his other children. And went back and told Tammy, and and this is from um, his blog that's still online. Uh, I knew then that uh, we were going to have four more children. I saw them all in vision, and I knew that Garth would one day behave. So I felt better. It was yeah. So I'll just say, and you guys can tell me if you disagree. One thing that feels very typically Mormon about this story that that can be problematic is. Mormons sometimes tend to get married so quickly uh, without really knowing each other well and, and just jump right into like career and kids that oftentimes Mormons don't develop uh, in their marriage high levels of, of connection and emotional intimacy. This goes back to some of the analysis uh, that, that Dr. John, I've, I've heard on the Hidden True Crime Hidden a true crime podcast that, that you've offered, Dr. John. And that often, who who knows whether you're really emotionally compatible, sexually compatible. Did you did you get to even get to know other types of people and have lots of experiences so that you can continue into your marriage with a high level of confidence and certainty that this is the person that um that you really want to be with for an entire lifetime of 40, 50, 60 years and, and not, eternity. Afterwards. Or eternity, yeah. yeah. Don't forget eternity, John. And, <laughs> and beautiful, yeah. And it's not that Mormons invented the midlife crisis either, but what I've found is this lack of really emotional connection and emotional intimacy and lack of just sometimes basic compatibility and friendship sets Mormons and, and often post-Mormons up 
for this kind of to to maybe even experience this midlife crisis in a pronounced way where you're just like who did i marry why did i marry this person i don't even really know them or love them i didn't even get to have normative let's just say college or high school experiences romantically right. and it it really can set people up to just wonder why they're even in this marriage to begin with tell me tell me if you think that Mormon characteristic of of rushed early marriages with lots of kids maybe might apply here. Do you want to take this, Dr. John? <laughs> Lord, no, why, I, are you smiling? I, why are you smiling, Lauren? <laughs> I, can't, I can't speak from the um from the Mormon Mormon angle, but um I, I think I can say that it's similar to what the the psychologist Eric Erickson talks about in his developmental stages. It, it, it's what he calls identity foreclosure which is that when you get married so young, you're really kind of shutting down some of your options for your future and you're really committing to a particular identity, um, which is something you probably haven't even had a chance to develop. So uh, it, it reminds me a lot of Erickson, one of Erickson's um, critical ideas in his psychosexual stages. Love it. Love it. Very good. Lauren, anything you want to add or not? John's my second marriage. So <laughs> <You're>, <laughs> enough said. <laughs> All right. Well, you know, I'm just going to admit that Margie and I went through this sort of thing when I lost my faith, particularly. I'm just like, wow, I had to, I had to figure out whether, the, you know, we were still a good fit and Margie and I are doing great. And we worked through that. But I don't know that we were the best of friends when we first got married. You know, yeah. we kind of rushed into it. So yep. I relate to that. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And that uh, goes with my empathy to Tammy too. I think that a lot of people have um, speculated, well, was she believing him? What's her problem? And I get very protective and defensive over Tammy Daybell. And I think for this very reason, she married very young. She did what she was supposed to do and she was a good wife and she raised her children. She was a good mother. And I'm sure she knew, like I said, how to dance the dance with Chad. And so um, I just want to throw that out there too. I, I, I just think she, she, she could have married someone else, but she married Chad Daybell. And that is a sad part of Tammy's story. Thank you for adding that, Lauren. I think that's really important. And tell me, Lauren and Minnie specifically, tell me if this is also true that, that the, the Mormon story of, of women, not necessarily getting educated, not not necessarily pursuing a career at first, but just getting married young and jumping into child rearing, it can leave women very vulnerable, vulnerable in the sense that, you know, the man's in charge, it's a patriarchy and the man is the ultimate final say in, in a, in a typical Orthodox Mormon patriarchal marriage. And what's a woman going to do her? She's got all these kids. She's got a, her job is to raise right. kids primarily. And so it can leave a woman very vulnerable to honestly, whatever the husband may decide he wants to do or pursue, a woman kind of often needs to just go along with her husband. I don't mean it's it's very much um, sort of a stereotype, but just tell me if there's anything. No, I think you said it well. I think I think that I concur. Um, it's um, the first time I got married, I was in my 30s and I had a career under my belt and um, a degree and independence. And so I think that really helped me, but I have questioned, well, um, if I had gotten married at 19, would it have been different? And I think it likely could have been. Mm -hmm. And I think that that, um, is something to point out too. um, you know, about Tammy Daybell, you don't, you don't, you know, normal is what one is accustomed to when you get married at 19, that's sort of how, you know, life to be. And so you can't really see a different way dr john pointed that out well with the identity you know identity but yeah and i think someone addressed earlier in the comments about women um mormon women in this story uh being drawn to this type of movement too because i think that they just are you know kind of hungering for some authority or or power or something outside of what they feel is offered to them so yes yes i think that a lot of uh women um, do find, um, some healing power 
in energy healing. And Absolutely. like I've said, uh, women did use to do healing blessings. My mom tells a story of blessing me as a baby. I had seizures when I was a baby. They didn't know what to do in New York City. And my mom tells the story of laying her hands on my head along with my dad and feeling a power. Um, my point in telling that story is that it's been very often and even recently that I think women have felt like they were able to uh, participate in these type of um, healing blessings and, and be part of the priesthood. And I think um, maybe that might be lacking a little bit more today. I'm not totally sure. Again, I was a baby. I don't remember in the 80s. But um, I think that a lot of women in the LDS church do find a bit of that healing power in energy healing. You know, um, they, they want to heal their families. They want to protect their families. And they can do that through being trained in energy healing and energy work and in um, so many of these uh, more unique uh, alternative medicine, and and I'm I'm pro alternative medicine, so I may be more like the kind of I don't know how to say it. I'm at a loss for words, but um, John called it woo woo. Woo woo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, well, that's a whole other podcast, but uh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I think it's time now to talk to the next stage, which is Chad becoming an author and a publisher. And we do have a clip of sort of a continuation of Chad's dream that comes from that, um, from that 2018 preparing a people talk where he talks about how his dream his near-death experience, let's just say, by his uh, by his account, uh, sort of uh, by his account, foreshadows him becoming an author. Do, do you guys? Does one of you want to kind of set up this next uh, part of the clip uh, about, about how he and any background about how he actually begins to develop a career for himself as an author and as a publisher? John anything i mean i think you just gave a great can we just roll I the clip roll and the then clip talk about it or? yeah i say roll the clip okay all right we'll roll the clip this is chad daybell again uh continuing his uh explanation of a near-death experience at the preparing a, a people conference in saint george october 2018 from the uh hidden a true crime podcast here we go Grandpa Keith started telling me that in the future I would write books based on my children's future. And he showed me like a panorama that just flipped through dozens of scenes, like a video, uh, a video wall, just showing me dozens of scenes of what, what happened to my children. And it was a great blessing. I soon returned to my body and kind of coasted to shore. My, Dad rushed to me and they took me to the hospital and I had to get some stitches and everything, but I bounced back and um, a few years later I started writing that series. And so that's how the Standing in Holy Places series began. It was, it's, it follows three families and I, I kind of combined a couple of the children, but it really is the story of what will occur to my children in a general sense. Not every detail, but the main character is named Emma, and that's my daughter, my oldest daughter. And it's just, at the time when I wrote it, I'd worked at a publishing company and we'd done a couple of near-death books. And Desert Book had rejected them and just kind of had some controversy about them. And so I felt inspired that it should be written fictionally and just not tell anybody about it based on the truth and just put it out there. And it sold really well, and so we we did a a couple of follow ups. The Great Gathering starts right as there's an earthquake in Utah, uh, Salt Lake Valley, and you follow some of the families go to the camp. Some of them uh, don't, and you see the the outcome of that. And so they gather to the camps. The follow up book talks about when they go to the the final battle ends in World War III, and they go to build a celestial city. This is actually a photo 
along the Missouri River, it looks like Switzerland or something, but um, by the end of the book, they actually get to Missouri. The third book talks about building up Zion and the great uh, meeting at Adam on Diamond and, and various other things, such as the return of the 10 tribes. I felt I was shown a lot of that. I think one of my sons will be involved in that, so I was able to see how they are brought to New Jerusalem. Um, the fourth book deals with Jerusalem itself quite a bit with the two apostles that go to Jerusalem and help protect it, and then just other things that are occurring as Zion grows in, in America. And the fifth book talks about the second coming and the renewed earth, and that had a lot of interesting insights as I wrote those books. That's where I received a lot of my visions, if you want to call it, as, as I'm actually typing, it's like they're downloading the scenes into my head. And so people ask me, how much is true? I always say, you ought to do a version where you just yellow highlight the parts that are actually true. And then just, <laughs> um, but it would be hard to do because even within the same paragraph, there's a lot of truth. And as I progressed, it seemed like the visions increased. And so by the time I got to renew her, I felt pretty confident that at least the general major scenes that I was describing are going to occur. And I hope that that series testifies of Christ and that he is in control. Uh, that, that part about the second coming and the burning of the earth uh, was a new concept to me, but I believe that the righteous will be resurrected and then they will join Christ in coming to earth and their very glory will be what burns the earth as it transitions to a terrestrial level. So we could kind of go on and on there. There is so much in that. And that's just what's so amazing, again, about your, your podcast and your YouTube channel. Y you guys have done the hard investigative journalistic work of assembling actual video and audio footage of, of podcasts and of, of, of conferences and interviews. And it, there's so much in that, just that clip. So right, right. yeah, well, that was an actual uh, advertisement that Chad Daybell edited or someone in his family edited um, that we received. And then the, the speech that we received was on somebody's phone. So I did place the ad over that. So yes, I mean, I want people to know some people said, well, did you, did he do that? Did you do that? I want to explain this speech came empty. Um, and I put the visuals on there and that was an actual advertisement of Chad Daybell's for his books. I love it. Um, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to play that there's a longtime listener named John O'Reilly. I'm pretty sure he's from Australia and he made the comment. This is unfair. They could be from any faith. The church is not up to blame for this. This is unfair. Micro focus on the Mormon church and I'm ex Mormon. Like I, I respect that point of view. That's the whole reason we're doing this yeah. series on Mormon stories. John O'Reilly is not alone as someone who, just thinks there's really no meaningful Mormon connection to this, although that's predominantly what Orthodox believing Mormons have to say. And I just can't believe that you could watch that clip of these five books. And it's talking about, you know, revelation and angels and, and the, and new Jerusalem and Adam on Diamon and, and Zion and the second coming and the gathering how you can see all that and say that that Mormonism isn't inextricably linked with kind of the senses of this case. Yeah, M Mindy, what what's your quick reaction? Not to show disrespect for John, but what I just I feel like I feel like these case this case is undeniably so Mormon. I loved how Lauren <laughs> said, um, "Yeah, I'll no, I'll say, oh, yeah, um, you you take. I'm passing the baton. Yeah, no, when you, I'm not an ex Mormon. I'm a Mormon." <laughs> and uh john is not alone the the commenter john there's a lot of johns today um <laughs> that oh you know we don't want to talk about this this is not lds when you have an a probable cause statement of somebody's murder 
that uh, the the murderers stated it's going to be a Nephi and Laban, Laban ending, it, it has to do with Mormonism. I mean, you can't separate the two. Did I mean, did these people take the religion to an extreme? Yeah, absolutely. Is everyone that's LDS going to go do this? No, or else we wouldn't be fascinated in this one case, you know, because it's unique. Um, I think yeah. by addressing the Mormon and LDS elements in it is to make sense of the crime and how this happened, which is what our podcast is, is about. It's about the hidden motives, the dateline, the basic, the surface motives are sex and money, right? That's like classic dateline narrative. We go into the hidden motives and you can't, you can't get into the hidden motives without understanding that this has to do with a belief system and, uh, deeply held beliefs and, um, religiosity and that it was, um, an LDS foundation. And that doesn't mean every Mormon is going to do this. Should, should well, I weigh in with a, a bit yeah. of a, a contrary point of view as, as <laughs> sure as, from the, as the a non Mormon, Mormon. Um, that somebody could make an argument that, uh, the near death experiences and, um, the book of revelation is, is really that though maybe those are the two key elements of this case and neither of those are particularly Mormon. Um, I know um, when I say that I'm, I'm making a high level argument and I'm not looking at the micro level as John points out um, not John, the host, but John, the commenter <laughs> um, <laughs> that. So, you know, technically I think you could say if you really get, get theoretical and, and, and kind of it, it go back to the metal level um, the near death experience part and the book of revelation is arguably the most important pieces of this case that it, at least the case that leads to, uh, the murder of a number of individuals. I love it. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I'm reminded of a, I'm going to be paraphrasing a quote I once heard, you know, there are always going to be good people doing good things and bad people doing bad things, but to get good people to do bad things, you need religion. And I, I'm, I'm not anti-religion at all, but I, I just am going to say, like you, like you said, Lauren, that if you're taught, you know, three chapters into the Book of Mormon, uh, Nephi, the one of the the protagonists of the entire Book of Mormon, one of the most important Mormon prophets, if not, you know, let's just say one of the three most important. Mormon prophets scripturally for sure when he's hearing voices from God and uh, the voices are telling him to chop the head off of uh, somebody else um, you know it, that, that that has some meaning and that has relevance and it's the type of thing that that has the potential it sort of almost gives license to people to just believe in the idea that the the voices in their head could be real or meaningful or divine and that they should act on them and that it can even be violent and a violent act can somehow still be sanctioned, sanctioned by, by God. By God. Right. I don't think that's, and, and if you look at like under the banner of heaven with John Krakauer and the Lafferty brothers, you, you, you know, the, the day nights, um, the mountain meadows massacre, you know, uh, you, you can't say that everyone, you know, in these situations were all psychopaths like Jeffrey Dahmer. At some point you have to say, is it possible that there's a, a, a set of doctrines and theologies that could lead good people down paths to then start to feel like uh, bad is good, frankly. Yeah. And and murder may be the extreme uh, example, right. but in next episode, when we start talking about the the swinging that goes on and the predatory sexual behavior, and it and gets the juicy folks, <laughs> the insurance fraud, and you know the claiming of of uh, insurance policies after people die, yes. and all these these prophecies of spouses dying ahead of time, all of that. You know, it can't be that everybody was a serial killer torturing insects and, and animals from their childhood. Lots of people are taken down this road, stopping short of murder because of a, a shared 
theology and set of doctrines and practices. Uh, that's just okay. me. People can disagree with me, but that's kind of ideology kind of, yeah. Right can kind of drive this. So why don't we just tell us like, uh, so that we know that Chad is, is, is authoring these books. Talk to us about, um, the books, how he becomes a publisher and, um, and that will lead us. Um, and, and then we'll stop short of talking about how he meets Julie and we'll stop short of the actual prepper movement and the avowed movement. But is there anything else we want to say, about Chad becoming an author and a publisher that that is important in advancing the story, or did we pretty much cover it? Well, he he started off his books when he began them by saying that they're fiction. I think that's important to say. And this was before he started talking about his near death experience books. This was before he knew Julie Rowe. His first books were written before he knew Julie Rowe, before he was giving speeches, before he claimed to have near death experiences, and he claimed in them that they were fiction. We have an we have an interview from two thousand seven, I believe, Doctor John that. Uh, says that he he's claiming their fiction but uh something does happen and he he changes his tune and and um starts to say that they're partially true you even see that in his advertisement a bit he's implying that but he actually says in that speech you just played that uh they they are real that he's he's downloading information from beyond the veil from his near-death experience and is writing books that are true. And he said that Des there was some controversy with Desert Book. That's a, you know, um, a church owned a church. I don't know who it's on. It's Bonneville owned bookstore. And that uh, there's some controversy with his books. And he, so he said, well, I just kind of like marketed them as uh, fiction, but, but they're real. They're true. He, he quotes that. And I, and I think that's important to kind of see the progression there. He's, these are, and then Dr. John can kind of tell you what he's read in these books. Um, he's read more of them than me. <laughs> um, like I was looking at those books and can never in a million years would I read one page of any <laughs> of these books. And yet, you know, we have a, we have a question from a listener. Jim Halpert asks, does anyone know how well his books sold? Apparently the books did pretty well that there was an audience for these books. Dr. John, do you want to, do you want to take the baton on that one? And, and anything about the substance of the books? Um, let me let me just back up a minute and and say that Chad's version of how the book started um, was based on his near death experiences, and he was just recounting those more or less. Um, but it's also it's interesting to note that he started writing these books in the late '90s. I think his first book was published in '98. And again, back in 98, there was no evidence that he was talking about near-death experiences, which means that sort of the non-Chad version of this is about fame and fortune in the Mormon world specifically. We know that Chad wanted to be famous in the Mormon world. And I think a big part of the books, um, the reason he started writing these books was, was for that motivation, not because um, he was downloading information from beyond the veil, but simply because... He wanted fame, at least within the Mormon world. So those are very different accounts of him being an author. And I think it's important to make that distinction. Thank you. Mindy, anything you want to add from your observations of that that video clip on the on the books? And I I um have to admit that I have not read any of Chad's books. <laughs> um, <laughs> some of, they're quite yeah. violent. Do you want to talk about the substance a little bit, John? Yeah, that's in would, them that what you've noticed. You know, they're 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 um. There's there's a lot of telling and not a lot of showing. So I mean, they're you know one of the one of the axioms of fiction is, you know, you tell the story. I mean, uh, uh, show the story and and don't tell it and let the readers figure it out, right? But it's with him, I think. You get a bunch of telling. So um, the narratives are a little awkward. You know, you, you, there's clearly a, a narrator that's in control and, and is going to kind of talk about the narrative more than show you the action. Um, there's a lot of violence and it's it, the violence is just kind of matter of factly, which is which is really peculiar. Um, it, it To me, that suggests that uh, there's a lack of empathy. Who, whoever's writing these books um, is talking about and showing a great deal of violence, but not with much empathy or concern. And um, that's interesting too. So um, aside from that, I mean, you know, the, the actual content is 
um, this post-apocalypse, this lead up to the post-apocalyptic world and how we get there. And then maybe some, some vision of what's going to happen after that. So that that's what they're about. And isn't there an evangelical Christian series called taken up or something that, that, that is along the lines of this type of genre about the rapture and probably, I don't know okay. about it. I, I know there is, yeah. but I, but I'm, uh, I'm not remembering it. Okay. So he publishes these books and you said these books were all before he meets Julie Rowe. Is that right? He's, he became an author before he met Julie Rowe. He, he it was Suzanne Freeman or Friedman that Freeman that he wrote that he met and he wrote the first near death experience book with her. She had a near death experience. Okay, okay, okay. But then she, then he met Julie Rowe and things really changed for him when he met Julie Rowe. Yeah. Uh, so I mean I don't know if Doctor John wants to explain that or not, but her books were incredibly popular and it was, they were near death experience books and it put him and his publishing company on the map. He, he had a lot of success and he experienced a lot of success and recognition. Really quickly. Our, our listeners are all jumping in to, to fill in my gaps. Uh, the Weber's Tim Rathbone, they all agree. It's the left behind series, which is kind of uh, the rapture. Books. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of fiction, Christian fan fiction about the rapture. Gail Clark as well. So as always, thanks to our listeners mm -hmm. for, for crowdsourcing uh, evidence and information. That's great. Uh, Dr. John, were you going to add anything else uh, behind what Lauren was saying? Uh, yeah. I, I think that's one of the things we discovered was, was Julie's, Julie Rowe's influence was enormous, um, not only in terms of Chad seeing the success of her books, but also that I, we think that um, that's when he started, you know, adopting this idea um, that his previous experience were near-death experiences. So uh, for many years, he didn't talk about it. And now all of a sudden around 2013, 14, he's saying that those were near-death experiences. And, and that's a game changer, I think, for him. I'm just going to say on Mormon Stories podcast, you know, I've been doing this 16 years. Uh, every single year, sometimes every month, I get somebody saying, John, you really need to cover near-death experiences on Mormon Stories podcast. And I've always just not wanted to. And I I, I just have to admit, I, I feel a tiny bit vindicated by, you know, in that I I haven't ever covered it because I, um, you know, on the, to say it kindly, um, I, I haven't always viewed them as really credible or meaningful other than kind of what goes on in the brain. That's going to offend some people and they're not going to like me for saying that, but, but to say it a little bit less charitably, I've, I've, I've worried that, uh, putting too much stock in or attention around near death experiences as meaningful or credible could be potentially dangerous. And, um, so I, I feel I, you know, that that's how I still feel, and now I feel it even more so after after all this um, has has come about. So really quickly, you you bring back uh, Julie Rowe. Let's we 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 began by introducing Julie Rowe and Dever Snuffer into kind of this equation. Now maybe it's time to transition to one important bridge, which is to discuss the Mormon prepper movement and a vow and preparing a people, because that that becomes kind of the soil for the marriage of, of Chad and Julie. Is that right? And, and eventually for Chad and Lori or Lori. well, Chad and Julie first and then right. Chad and Lori yeah. later. And yeah. I, I say marriage, I, I, I meant that metaphorically, the union, <laughs> okay. the, the partnership. There are a lot of marriages in this story. <laughs> so you gotta, <laughs> you never know what the, right, with this story. I'm like, <laughs> so give our listeners a little bit who, who wants to tell us a bit about, Mormon preppers, what a vow is. We, we've talked about it a bit, but anything else we want to say about the Mormon prepper movement or a vow of preparing a people? Maybe I'll start by playing a little clip that I found, and then you guys can uh, follow up and, and fill in the blanks. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay, so this is a clip that isn't yours, uh, Lauren and, and Dr. John, but, but we thought it's basically Chad promoting... Um, one of these preparing a people events, um, kind, kind of, oh, yes. kind of advertising it or marketing it a little bit. So we'll, we'll, we'll jump to that and then we'll come back to you guys. Great. Hello. 
Welcome everybody to Preparing a People Conference Announcement with Chad Daybell, one of our main speakers. We are holding the first Rexburg Conference in the Tabernacle up there on Saturday, July the 15th. And our theme is Uplifting the Downtrodden and Healing the Brokenhearted, which we all can relate to, right? I'm just very honored to be part of the conference. I've recently released my autobiography entitled Living on the Edge of Heaven, where I tell more about my two near-death experiences and how that prompted me to write my novels. And I will also, at the conference, talk a little bit more about my upcoming novel, where I talk more about uh, some of the refugees that I've seen coming from the West Coast after there's destruction and, and troubles there, and how we will be able to assist them and help them not only physically, but also spiritually and help them in their lives. And I'm eager to share that with you. So we are really excited to have Chad. He's, Chad's one of my favorite people. In fact, we he used to be in Springville and then we followed him to, to Rexburg. Yeah. But seriously, after this, you can click on and get more information about all the speakers that are going to be at the conference. You can buy tickets on the website. And we're really excited that we think this is going to be a great event and this is going to be a lot of fun for a lot of people to get together. It's going to be a little bit different than some other conferences, but I think everyone will be very happy, very surprised. Chad, thanks for coming. We look forward to having you there. I'm excited to be there. Thanks. So uh, maybe a little bit different is an understatement, but... You know, that, that one of, for me, one of the key words in, in that little commercial that really gets talked a lot about when you talk about Julie Rowe, this idea of a refugee and this idea of like this apocalyptic vision that Julie Rowe was really into that also became the backbone of a vow and preparing a people, this idea. who Do you guys want to explain what a refugee is and what refugees are doing and what these safe houses are. Can you, can someone paint the apocalyptic picture of what, what's going on here so that then we can talk about just kind of this, this mental reality that all these people are sharing this apocalyptic sure. end of times reality that then becomes the backbone for the prepper movement for a vow and preparing a people who wants to tackle that. I can share a bit what, unless you want. Refugee. And what are the safe houses? <laughs> well, I, I was going to say, I'll share a little bit. And I think actually a good person to maybe touch on this would be Mindy, too, okay. because I know that she says she's had a personal experience with a family member uh, that's, you know, been in this. I didn't even know really about this strong movement until I started covering this case. But uh, first off, also, I want to point out that they said that they were in Springville. That, that's Mike and Nancy James that you see there. They're the founders of Preparing a People. They did so many podcasts and gave Chad a, a platform. Absolutely. And I want to say that because they have uh, since taken down all of their videos and podcasts with Chad and Lori. Um, but I, you know, Preparing a People was big. So I want to point them out. But um they said that Chad moved up to Rexburg and then they followed. And one thing I'm also wanting to point out and notice is that Rexburg is supposed to be the central to this and East Idaho to this apocalyptic thing that's going to happen. Even according to Julie Rowe, who was living in Kansas, she was always in East Idaho. I mean, I think she found her audience there and, you know, she would fill the tabernacle in Rexburg with like 2000 people sharing her visions of this, you know, the second coming and they discuss the refugees coming, refugees, you know, refugees are refugees. <laughs> I, don't even, I mean, refugees are supposed to be from other countries. You know, Chad yeah, Daybell talks about people from California. California. Is it California? Yeah, I was going to say, Chad Daybell talks about them coming from California. Yeah, there, there's never any mention of refugees coming from the East Coast. So apparently the East Coast just doesn't exist. Yeah. And there's no refugees coming from like another country either. No, it's yeah. those. It's um, but, but, a very California area that we're talking about. Well, you no talked about in that France. speech we played. Oh, go ahead. Do you want to paint the refugee picture or do you want me to? Because I just heard that one episode where they were talking about Julie Rowe and, and her the nonprofit she creates right, the, for refugees. It's the uh, Girl on Fire it, episode. Yes, it's the Greater Tomorrow Relief, Relief Fund. Fund. And uh, the, a Greater Tomorrow. GTRF. GTRF, yeah. yeah. So a Greater Tomorrow is the, is it the first book that Julie published about her near death that just really – put her on the map with the near death experiences. I think it was her first book. Agreed. Yes. Talking about natural disasters and solar flares. Do you want to paint that picture or do you want I mean, 
Do you want me to? You seem pretty I'd, jazzed about Okay, I'm going to talk about it. So yeah, ahead. so I'm listening to that episode <laughs> that you guys just referenced. And it's like Julie Rowe is like telling everybody, listen, like there's going to be wars, natural disasters, earthquakes, solar flares. They're going to like shut down all the power grids. There won't be, you know, fuel. You won't be able to drive a car. When she talks about refugees, she's painting this kind of apocalyptic dystopian vision of like cars no longer working, even ATVs don't work. And we've got to prepare. We've got to prepare right. because the the geopolitical financial infrastructure is going to collapse. Mm -hmm. uh, nothing's going to work. And everybody's going to like be starving and killing each other. And there's going to be mayhem. And there's going to be all these people that are going to need to relocate. And so on foot from the East Coast and the West Coast, they're going to be walking somehow for some reason to Rexburg of all places. And we need to set up safe houses. I, I know. Am I sounding crazy? We need to set up safe houses along the way with like food storage and ammunition and, you know, ATVs with, with fuel and pilots who can fly people places and yep. medical supplies because it's going to be mayhem and we want to help the elect Maybe it's even the 144,000 that need to gather to the church of the Lamb of God, or I don't even know. I'm making stuff up at this point, but like, <laughs> no, I think it's all accurate. We it's have pretty, to, it's we have to set up yes. the, these way stations for these refugees on foot that are all coming to Rexburg, and we need to create a nonprofit. And by the way, give me lots of money I mean, yes. because I, Julie Rowe, this mother who's on psychotropic meds for bipolar i'm the one anointed person that's gonna set up the infrastructure uh to allow for these way stations to prepare the people to all come to rexburg where we're going to prepare the world for the second coming of jesus am i am i am i making this up am i being too sarcastic no, like this is where it kind of goes off right I think it's important to note as well, in addition to uh, Julie's, um, her relief fund and the refugees and the the safe houses and all that, uh, one of the commenters, Stephen Eliason, asked about the book Visions of Glory. And I think that's an important book to, um, to highlight. And uh, Stephen asked, I wonder if Chad read that one. I believe Chad's publishing company published the book Visions of Glory, which I know is a very popular book in the in the prepper community and in the, the avow group. And so that book also um, talks about um, the calling out and the tent cities where people will have to flee and go. So it's a, it's a little bit of a similar uh, vibe as, you know, people needing to go somewhere safe and away from, you know, the wickedness that's sure to come and to take over. And so similar. And, you know, there, there's, you know, this has been a real thing, Mindy, and this is where anything you do or don't want to say about this, this is a real phenomenon in, in Mormonism in Utah and Idaho and Arizona, this idea of preppers that are spending not just tens of thousands of dollars, but like literally cashing in their life savings. This is where the Latter-day Saints sort of a millennialistic strain of Mormonism really comes into bear here, where people are... You, do you want to talk about the types of things people are buying, the types of money, the types of investments oh, goodness. So, that, that preppers all over Utah and Idaho and Arizona are? Yeah. So, you know, I think it starts with most, you know, devout Mormons believing that we, you know, should be prepared for um, whether it be natural disasters or financial changes in your family. And I think a lot of probably most mainstream Mormons would agree that it's good to have some storage, food storage or, and money and, and stuff repaired. But this just goes so far beyond Takes it to 11. That. It's, Takes it's, it to 11. It's, yes. It's, oh goodness. Um, and Lauren and Dr. John, you can add some things, but, um, uh, tents and not just, uh, not just regular tents, but like army style, you know, tents, um, MREs, like MREs, um, uh, thousands of rounds of ammunition um, and other weapons uh, to defend yourself. Um, uh, rifles. Uh, charcoal, um, 
lot of money money and, and like coins and and gold and silver currency, and, and currency interesting currency, currency yeah. yes um that those are the things that are coming to my mind um but but people are literally cashing in their 401k oh yes their life savings yes to buy this stuff because they're like why why well, you don't need a retirement Oh, it's not going to matter because the world's you know, going to end. And I think a lot of this is also tied up into um, feelings about the government. And I think that this this movement um, gained a lot of traction a few years ago during um, the like the Obama administration. And I don't want to touch on that too much, but um, I do think that that was part of it um, in my experience with with the the activity that I witnessed with in with my family members. So. And I, and I just have to say, and we've got a great series on Mormon stories with uh, his, historian Matt, Matthew Harris about Ezra Taft Benson and the rise of kind of the Republican political right within Mormonism. I just don't think, you know, when we talk about connections, Mormon connections to this whole thing, you just can't deny that the whole Ezra Taft Benson, John Bircher Society, uh, suspicion of government, anti-government, right. A new world order conspiracy theory uh, sort of mindset just prepared, primed, groomed, and prepared the way for a largely less educated rural, but not exclusively I, I Mormons. Yeah, I, I think that that is the case sometimes, but I don't think that's always, all. It's, I think always. we would be surprised by how many Draper, maybe more Sandy, educated, higher yeah. socioeconomic level. Um, but, but certainly the John Bircher, Ezra Tap Benson stuff yeah, influences it, it, it for sure. creates this fertile ground right. for, for this kind of prepper stuff too, because right. it really is an extension of that, yeah. of that sort of mindset of, of sort of distrust of the federal government and, and, and sympathies for conspiracy theories. I yeah. don't know. Yeah. That's what I, I think. Um, Lauren and Dr. John, anything you guys want to add to that? Uh, anything else about preppers and uh, a vow and preparing a people? Uh, one, one thing I don't want to add quickly is, is that Julie Rowe is still talking this talk. And good that's a good point. Julie Rowe has just recently. Um, you mean now you mean in 2021. Like, I, like I mean, you. now, I mean, like as in the last month, she's yeah. talked about the end of the world happening in 2022 um, not, we don't have an exact date, but, but fairly soon, probably within the next year or maybe six months. So this is ongoing. This is real. This is an extension of Chad Dable's thought. And, um, you know, I think this potentially, um, becomes a public safety issue at some level, maybe, I don't know. Um, but, um, but it's an interesting, I think it's an interesting situation that, that one of the people that was so influential in this situation or this case um, that may not have been directly tied to um, the murders or, or the events that occurred that, you know, to Chad and Lori, um, that thought is still out there and it's still active and it's still being promoted. I think it's interesting that, um, that the church hasn't like explicitly talked about this. Um, and Lauren, were you saying something where some of the local Rexburg folks were had a visit from a general authority and were wishing that it would be addressed? I'm remembering that. Yeah, yeah, a couple of things. But first off, I want to say, um, yeah, I'll touch on everything. Um, first, with what Dr. John said, I think that is our big concern. And I, I feel like that's why Dr. John and I are, are you know, still working on this so strongly and, and caring so much about this is um, we're getting letters from from people saying thank you. Thank you for talking about Julie Rowe. My grandmother has spent her entire savings. My my mother has, um, you know, done A, B, C, and D. And um, it's real. And I think that for people that don't believe in Julie's gifts, we can laugh at it. But I, I think that that's an important point Dr. John makes to reiterate that it's it's there are thousands and thousands of people who, who believe in Julie Rose gifts and in her visions and what this is. And this thought is an extension of, of Chad Daybell, as he points out. Um, the church has come out since, so the, the church has not explicitly talked about these uh, murders, this crime at all, multiple murders. Um, they have updated their church handbook to um, tell people to distance themselves from energy healers. 
That's right. Who usually want money. So they, they have made that, which has actually made then several, um, I mean, and, and then on the flip side of that, there are several, I think LDS women who do earn a living, you know, a modest living, maybe doing that and they've been trained and, and that's actually kind of hurt them too. I mean, I'm not saying here, I'm just sharing, um, what they've, I think that, you know, what they've stated as far as that goes, but I will say this, um, so the town of Rexburg, let's just talk about that. This is where these crimes occurred and Rexburg residents have been greatly affected. I have a lot of empathy for those living in Rexburg. Rexburg is a tight knit community. It's a small community. It's a, it's a college town. You have BYU, Idaho. That's there. It's like over 90% LDS. That's incredible. You know, there, there are not many places in the world where it's, you know, that saturated in, in, a, in a belief system. So it's, you know, over 90% LDS and this crime, the killing of two children, as well as Tammy Daybell's death. So, I mean, we haven't even mentioned the victims by name. Let's do that because this is what this is about. Yes. And I, I have my bracelets here, justice for JJ and Tylee. And I have their picture behind me, but Tylee Ryan was 16 years old and JJ was seven. I think that um, tomorrow would have been Tylee Ryan's 19th birthday, just to put in perspective. And I think that yesterday was the day um, that JJ was killed in Rexburg and buried in Chad Daybell's yard. So it's a poignant and sad week, you know, for those who miss these children. But um, they were killed in Rexburg um, by a member of the LDS church, and it has really shaken Rexburg residents. And they write us and say, they, uh, someone writes us and say, you know, you don't know who to trust. You don't know who's believing a vow. You know, before Chad Daybell, before the bodies were found in Chad Daybell's yard, um, and I'm, we're really jumping ahead. I hope that's okay, but I'll just lay the foundation here. Oh, it's for beautiful the, you know. because it, this is, how do, how can we not mention the victims? And, yes. and if you're going to talk about Rexburg, this is great. So keep going, Lauren. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Um, when I'm full screen, full screen, I can't see your <laughs> verbal, so I don't know. But, um, so, uh, before the bodies were found, you know, once Chad was in the news, there were, there was a lot of division. People would say, there's no way Chad did this. There's no way he was involved in this. Lori Dable was newer to the area. She only moved there for Chad's. So she was from Arizona originally, where her husband, Charles, was killed. Um, so separate state, separate crime. But he, with, with the two missing children went missing in Rexburg. <clears throat> Tammy Daybell was killed in Rexburg. So these Rexburg residents were actually really divided. You know, Chad is a great guy. I believe Chad. Other people were like, clearly, look at the evidence no way he's absolutely come on he's clearly involved the avow website that you mentioned earlier mindy um stood by chad and pretty much had a rule that if you um that if you put chad down or try to question chad daybell you will be you know kicked from the site there will be no that you know talking down about chad daybell and um, Christopher Parrott is who runs a vow. Okay. He stood by Chad. He said, I've talked to Chad. He made a statement on a vow. I know that this is a custody battle and you guys, the truth will come out. The media is wrong. So again, that whole, you know, um, fear of, you know, the media and, um, evidence. And so this town of Rexburg was really shaken. I hope I've laid the foundation for people to understand that this is a religious crime. This is a man that was trusted in the community. This is someone with a shared belief of everyone else there. This town does not see crimes like this. They don't see murders, let alone the murder of two children. You know, mm -hmm. um, the way Tylee Ryan's body was found was, was, um, it's, it was heinous. It was brutal. And so the church has never mentioned this murder this crime. I'm, I've been in PR. I've been in, um, you know, in the news I've, I've worked with the church's PR department with my job a lot. Um, I get that a PR, you know, you know, expert would probably say, just, just leave this one alone. You know, mm -hmm. but, uh, to those in Rexburg, I think it was different. And they, this, you know, when something happens in a college or in a high school, that's really traumatic and you bring in counselors and you bring in mental health experts. I think that's what Rexburg was kind of needing. If that makes sense to yeah. anyone, they needed 
help. They were in a crisis. And um, I'm allowed to tell this story for the first time. But um, so Heather Daybell has become my good friend through this case. Heather Daybell is Chad Daybell, sister-in-law and her and his name. And they were in the same ward even. So Heather Daybell is married into the Daybell family. And Dieter Uchtdorf was coming into town, Rexburg, shortly after this crime was, you know, committed and all over the news. And Heather Daybell thought, finally, like, finally, the church is going to talk about this. This is my favorite apostle, and he's coming to Rexburg. I know that this is going to be about, you know, the murders of JJ and Tylee and Tammy. Like, thank you. And she showed up, and she was ready to um, have an apostle of her church talk about this crime and this crisis. She said it was her crisis and it was also a community crisis. And she was so disheartened when all he did was mention missionary work. And he didn't even mention anything that was going on. And, you know, take what you want from this story. I'm relaying it. Um, but I feel really heartbroken for the people in Rexburg that this has affected. And um, I feel really heartbroken for JJ and Tylee and that the church has never mentioned their names, specifically Tylee. And um, I want to say this too, and, and I, I'll say how I feel, I guess. Because <laughs> um, it's affected me. You know, Tylee was 16. Her Facebook still there. Her background uh, photo is a temple. She loved the church. Um, she was very dedicated to her faith and her church. And um, she loved her mother too. You know, she loved her mother. And uh, clearly her mother, who was Lori Daybell. Um, thank you, Heather. <laughs> I loved, you know, clearly... Um, Lori Daybell was her mother and she failed Tylee miserably in the worst way, right? I mean, that's, you know, Tylee was killed. And I thought, you know, who, you know, the children were missing for a very long time before their bodies were discovered in Chad's yard. Um, who was going to stand up for this, this girl, this little girl? She was 16. And, you know, I, I, I had hoped myself that, um, the church would have stood up and said, help us find, you know, this daughter of God, Tylee Ryan, you know, help us find her or let's talk about her. Let's mention her name. You know, when your family fails you, you know, the church should be there. And I feel like I, I try to take a step back and say from a PR perspective, okay, I get it. Don't mention this crime. You don't want to be involved in it, but from a matter of protecting your own and um, loving your own, and who was going to stand up for Tylee, I felt that the church should have said something. And I felt and still feel that the church should have at least wrapped their arms around the city of Rexburg and helped them through this crisis. It's a continuing crisis. This has affected everyone in that town. Wow. Well said, Lauren. So beautiful, so powerful. And John, Dr. John, I just want to say that that kind of I mean, I think this is a natural place to kind of end today's episode and and maybe to give a a foreshadowing of of part two. But but John, we kind of started as we're as we're sketching out the the upbringing of Chad and the biography of Chad, this idea that far too often in in some or many Mormon families, you just don't go there. You just don't talk about the elephant in the room. And what a powerful way to kind of bring this episode towards closure, Warren, for you to share that story where, heck, one of the members of the First Presidency, I'm not sure the if Uchtdorf was in the First Presidency oh, or not at the time he spoke, but Uchtdorf has served in the First Presidency of the church, which is basically he was the number number two guy in Mormonism for many, many years before he was removed. Um what an opportunity he had to address this and provide pastoral healing and care. And, but, but he did 
what many would say is the typical Mormon thing to do, which is to act like nothing has ever happened and metaphorically at the funeral to give the plan of salvation talk. You know what I'm saying? Right. Yeah. Which so I want to show this funeral. because you're right. We yeah. didn't mention, we didn't even mention these two until the end of this podcast, but yesterday. So two years ago, yesterday, JJ was murdered. He, I believe he was buried today in chat two years ago today in Chad's yard. Tylee's 19th birthday is tomorrow, you know, and, and that this is what this is about. Um, yes, adults were murdered too, but you know, these two children had no one because their mother was responsible. And, um, you know, I wish, yeah, that the church would say their names. Yeah. Say their names. Thank you, Lauren. It's beautiful. And, and maybe this goes back to one of the, uh, um, tenets of Mormonism you discussed earlier that the, you said it would, might have been somewhat controversial, but the idea of favoring favoring religion over family, um, and and I don't know that that's accurate, but that that was one of the things you listed, John. So um, I just wanted to to reiterate that. But um, uh, you know, to to get back to what you were saying, John, that the um. And the healthiest families. So one of the things we like to do in our podcast is, you know, we talk about the criminal mind and and the worst of the worst in human beings. But we also like to ask, what ifs? You know, what what would health? What would mental health look like? What would healthy people do here? And um, as you say, you know, the elephant in the room is is ignored. It's avoided. And um, and in the healthiest families, the elephant room in the room is addressed and it's it's talked about and it's everything is on the table in the healthiest families. Um, communication is very open. Uh, emotions are not suppressed. Um, and so and so um, I think that's an interesting observation. Love it. Very good. Yeah. And just to circle back, we're next next week we're going to start off by talking about how kind of the combination of prepare people, avow, and the prepper movement, plus Julie Rowe, plus Chad Daybell, um, provides we really talked much about Lori. Provide yeah. th then provides mm -hmm. the the critical mass for Lori to enter yes. the picture. Yes. And I just would say, it's my belief that for this all to end in something as severe as murder because all, all my opinion is is not that chad was just necessarily a born murderer or that Lori was a born murderer there needs to be in my view with with this particular situation a cultural context that raises the stakes to the level where something this severe would happen and so for me, adding thousands of followers, the Rexburg Tabernacle being overflowing, conferences in multiple states, including Utah, St. George, including Arizona. Arizona, you know, thousands and tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of dollars at stake, competition for book selling, competition for workshops, um, schisms within the community and, and reputations at stake. And again, what we're going to be talking about next week, sexual impropriety, you know, but, but, but you need that critical mass of kind of a home base of thousands and thousands of people caring and engaging and volunteering and supporting this. You need all that to lead to the cultural context that, that elevates the stakes that, that takes it to to where someone like Chad or Lori would would consider performing these murders. And, and just to close it, that's kind of what Rexburg, I think, was and, and maybe still is. It's this critical mass of thousands of people willing to donate time and money and their reputations and their belief and even get excommunicated for right. these right. these doctrines and theologies and leaders and new prophets and teachings that that are emerging is that fair to say yes yes mm -hmm. yep yeah well i think we've i think we've kind of uh 
I think we kind of did what we hoped to do. And we're about three hours in, which is kind of what we envisioned. For Until tomorrow. Part yeah. one. <laughs> yeah. And I don't know whether we're doing this tomorrow. We can talk afterwards about whether we do this tomorrow or um, next week or when. But yeah, we still have to cover. Um, we have to cover Chad and uh, uh, Chad and uh, Julie teaming up. And then we're going to talk about uh, Chad's development of what we're calling third tier theology. Uh, who is it? That we, Eric, Eric Smith. Eric Smith mm -hmm. helps introduce right. that term. Then we'll talk about Lori Vallow's background. We'll talk about Chad and Lori meeting. We'll talk about the emergence of polygamy or celestial spiritual wifery or swinging, whatever you want to call it. A little bit. I got to get the sex in there somewhere. Yeah. And then we'll end with talking about the crimes. And I think part of the um, the three tier talks is where the, we are introduced to the multiple probations, which is a huge component. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. The, the zombies. The zombies the, and the, the, dark, the and dark and light spirits and all that. But we're hoping that our listeners and viewers, well, number one, Lauren and Dr. John, I hope that we uh, are doing honor to your amazing work by attempting to spotlight your amazing work and just to give a brief summary of the amazing, groundbreaking, in-depth journalistic and analytical work that you guys have done. So I, I hope you guys feel respected and honored by today in we these do. three hours. Absolutely. We are absolutely yeah, we honored. Thank you. We, we, we abs I do. We absolutely do. And um, uh, I still want a copy of Mindy's notebook. So um, <laughs> coming, if, Dr. John, you got it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, if there's if there's something if there's a real takeaway here, I think it's that notebook. <laughs> it's that Mindy is going to be the third co-host. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, the true for sure. I cannot recommend your work enough, especially for those who. <laughs> who uh who are not only fascinated with this case but i think you guys provide such a unique viewpoint with lauren's mormonism and uh journalistic um finesse you're just an amazing journalist lauren and then Thank dr you. john your your wealth of knowledge is just so valuable you guys are a really incredible team so i'm so glad you came on today how do people follow, how do people find your YouTube channel, find your podcast and, and how can people support your work? Maybe Thank let's, you. let's end there. Thank you for asking that. So our podcast is hidden, a true crime podcast. You can find that on any platform where there are podcasts. You know, if you listen on Apple or Spotify or Google or on and on or Stitcher. So hidden, a true crime podcast. And then our YouTube channel that we started after the podcast uh, is Hidden True Crime. That's our channel where we have a lot of interviews. We're working on another podcast right now and to add all of the interviews to our podcast. Again, as Dr. John points out, we're new to the podcasting world, so not everything is on both platforms. So definitely check them both out. We we have not gotten everything together in, in one place. So uh, separate, separate areas. And then we have uh, for support, thank you, we have uh, a Patreon account, uh, Hidden True Crime Patreon, where we do some additional bonus episodes with uh, uh, talking about some other crimes as well and some psychological um, elements to those crimes. And then what else, Dr. John? What am I missing? Um, and we're working on a website that should be up shortly that'll feature most of our work or all of our work. And um it's taken some time, but we're excited about it. And that'll be, um, that, that can be found at some point in the next month at, uh, hidden true crime.com hidden true crime.com will be the website. And we, uh, like I said, you know, it's all, it's just been the two of us so far doing this. And so things have been slow, slower than we had wanted, but, uh, we are finally getting the support that we needed to, to put other work aside. And we are really excited and we, um, are really, you know, hoping to continue to help in this case as well as others. We we really have a staff of one, which is Lauren, because <laughs> I've been I've been preoccupied with uh, a, a federal case and a murder. I've been involved in some pretty high level cases in the last three or four months, and it's taken a lot of time. So uh, I'm doing my best to to stay involved in everything, um, and I hope that once we finish those, that um, 
I'll have a lot more time to join my other staff member <laughs> um, as she does her interviews and, and does an amazing job with our YouTube channel. But we're we're getting closer all the time and um, we're really excited about what we're going to do in the future. Oh, and, and, and uh, you know, Dr. John, we did just so we have a, a show most Friday nights called TGIF where I um, have a guest and then Dr. John does a show on Wednesdays. And so last night we did something for uh, domestic abuse survivors in memory of Gabby Petito. And so we are doing some yeah, uh, and, and weekly and live shows as well. Those are my, my show is called The Hidden Hour. Yeah. It's it's like 6, 6 p.m. Pacific time every Wednesday. On your YouTube channel. And the TGIFs. Um, many With Lori Hellis. Lori Hellis. She's an attorney. Um, are we, she's uh, not practicing Live. She's a retired defense attorney. She lives yeah. in Arizona now, and she's writing a book on the Daybell case. Right. And uh, the two of us are teaming together tomorrow night. To there has been some hearings. Some uh, right. Chad Daybell's had some hearings this week, and she's going to catch us all up tomorrow night, seven so p.m. Pacific. Yes, are fascinating to kind of uh, deep dive into the legal aspects, which I have found really fascinating as well. Yes, we've got the attorney, the journalist, and the psychologist. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and, and links to all of these assets will be in the show notes uh, at mormonstories.org and on the YouTube channel for anyone who wants just a quick and easy link. So please support these guys with your subscribes, with your follows, with your likes, with your forwards of links, and with Thank your you. Patreon donations, because this, this stuff ain't cheap. People deserve to be compensated for their amazing work. Thank and you. let's 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 make this podcast. Let's send this podcast to the moon in all the good ways. <laughs> thank Thanks, you, John. Thank you, John. Thanks, Mindy. Yeah, thank You're you, welcome. Mindy. All right, Lauren and Dr. John. So we'll have you guys back at least for one more uh, part two. Is that all right? Yep. Yep. yep at least. Yeah. Okay. Yep, we're looking forward to it. Wonderful. And Mindy, you know, we we listeners are are loving. Uh, listeners and viewers are loving Kara Burrell. <laughs> I know you love uh, Carol's contribute yes. Carol's contributions, and you're you're kind of a badass co-host. Oh, well, if I can swear, my nerves out a little bit, but yeah, thank you, John. Oh, it's, it's been fun. It's so fun. <laughs> Let me fist bump you. It's All so right. fun to have you here, and it's <laughs> your wisdom and oh, you, in-depth knowledge is so great. You're just yeah. lovely, and and shout out to Steve mm -hmm. and uh, and Shannon mm -hmm. uh, Caldwell Montez, and and we're just grateful. We're grateful to have the Caldwell family taking over Mormon Story Podcast. <laughs> so uh, just let me know. I, oh, maybe goodness. I just won't come. Maybe oh, yeah. I just won't come the next episode. Yeah. Do you want to make the Kara. Me and Kara. You and Kara, over. you just take over. Okay. It, it's a deal. No, but thanks, Mindy. You're awesome. You're welcome. All right. We'll My see you. It's an honor to be here. Okay. And listeners, please email us. And, uh, oh, there's a, there's a message here. Ellen, it's not even Steve. Ellen is saying... Uh, <laughs> Mindy is a fantastic oh, thank addition. You, Ellen. So, Steve is your only fan. <laughs> Steve and I aren't your only no, fans. Does. Okay, good to know. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but but listeners, uh, thanks for joining us and viewers. We love your live comments. They made things so much better. Please email us at mormonstories at gmail.com with your feedback. Please send us your feedback at mormonstories.org for this um, post. We love your comments on YouTube and on Facebook. And um, we're just grateful for all the people that support Mormon Stories and the Open Stories Foundation with your donations. If you value this type of programming, let us know. Give us your feedback. If you want us to help fixing, sorry for the audiovisual glitches. We'll keep mm -hmm. trying to work those things out. Thanks for your patience. We are staff sometimes of one or two as well, but um, we'll keep getting it better. But if you love this programming and you want to see it continue, feel free to go to mormonstories.org. Click on the donate button. Um, become a monthly donor and uh, your donations are tax deduct deductible in the U.S. We're transparent in our finances and we will keep creating this content for as long as people want to support it. So thanks, everybody. You guys take care. Be good to Bye, each everyone. other. Thank you. Love to the, to the families mm -hmm. of the, the Vallas and the Daybells and all the families. Tylee and JJ. Tylee and JJ. Charles. And the Woodcocks, who yeah. are JJ's grandparents. Yes. Lots Very of good to them. Hard work. Hard Annie. week for them. Our, our love uh, and heartfelt um, condolences and support goes out to all of them. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Thanks. See you next time on Mormon Stories Podcast. Bye, everybody.